Right. Hello, everyone, and um, thanks so much for joining us uh, for Layers Rock Art Across Space and Time. Uh, to provide some context to this conference and the exhibition uh, which accompanies it, um, Layers Rock Art Across Space and Time was conceived as a traveling exhibition that brings together artists and scholars from Latin America, Europe, and Africa. Um, the exhibition and conference are held in collaboration with the embassies of Spain, Argentina, Chile, Colombia, France, Italy, Mexico, and Portugal. Um, they foreground the impact of a particularly pivotal moment in human history and its ramifications in the present. Um, the exhibition is also supported by the European Union National Institutes for Culture, and the first iteration of the exhibition was held at Nairox, which is located in the Cradle of Humankind World Heritage Site, and that opened on the 26th of November last year, um, and ran until the 15th of February, and the show will then travel to Cape Town and Johannesburg. Um, it included works by Cameron Platter, Diana, v Diana Vives, Angela Ferreira, uh, Stephanie Comida, Richard Forbes, Inga Sundiala, Carl Bijou, Jenna Birchall, Bruce Arnott, Joni Brenner, Elinka Echeverria, Deneo Seshi Bopape, Victor E. Kameno, Matt Shivers, and Willem Boschoff. Um, both the exhibition and conference take as its base the understanding that rock art predates language, our ability to name, classify, describe, and effectively communicate with others. Aside from the figurative, the symbols found therein, asterisks, dots, half circles, lines, caviforms, cross hatches, spirals, triangles, and so on, triangles, and so on, may well prefigure the graphic systems used to develop the written word, enabling information to pass from one generation to the next. Uh, speaking about the rock art of Europe, for example, Genevieve von Potzinger makes the astounding observation that only 32 signs have been discovered throughout the entire continent of Europe over a 30,000 year period. The implication is that such marks were not random, but represent a complex system of communication, the meaning and purpose of which is subject to ongoing debate. What did these marks mean, and who was their intended audience? One might be tempted to think that our ancient ancestors were trying to tell us something, in the manner, say, of those tasked with developing future-proof warning labels for nuclear waste deposits, or those who sent messages into outer space on Voyager 1 and 2. We cannot say for sure. What we do know is that the emergence of rock art, or more broadly, marks and engravings on rock, signals a pivotal moment in the history of our species running hand in hand with the realization that one thing can be used to represent another. Uh, Cormac McCarthy describes this singular eureka moment as central to everything that we do, from using colored pebbles for the trading of goats to art and language and on to using symbolic marks to represent pieces of the world too small to see. It is the bedrock of all the world's beliefs and religions, the backbone of commerce, and according to Yuval Noah Harari, the only thing that truly distinguishes Homo sapiens from other species, enabling large numbers of strangers to cooperate successfully through believing in common myths. Such myths abound in the paintings of old, be it in the depictions of jaguars in the Chiribiquet Mountains of Colombia, which date back some 20,000 years, the association between the gods and rain that one finds in the rock art of Mexico, or the goddess Marie in the Basque territory of Spain. Although subject to romanticization, such myths also enabled like-minded strangers to function in unison towards a common goal, suggesting that the rock art of, of old has much to teach us about the construction of the modern nation state and our capacity to organize and act. In this way, the study of rock art provides crucial insights not only into the world of our ancestors, but our present and future. Lending credence to Judith, Judith Shalansky's observation that the earth itself is, as we know, a heap of rubble from a past future, and humanity the thrown together bickering community of heirs to a numinous yesteryear that needs to be constantly appropriated and recast, rejected and destroyed, ignored and suppressed, so that, contrary to popular belief, 
It is not the future, but the past that represents the tr true field of opportunity. That most rock art dates back some 70 to 30,000 years to a period in which our species witnessed the invention of boats, oil lamps, bows and arrows and needles, as well as religion, commerce and social stratification, should tell us something about its significance on the global stage. With every new epoch comes a new layer, a new skin or sediment, to the point where the earth has become wholly consumed by human activity. It goes without saying that the scale of urbanization, agriculture, industrialization, etc. would not have been possible without language or a system such as rock art around which ideas could be expressed, preserved and bettered. Taking as its base the understanding that archaeology has always been about design, a form of reverse engineering that highlights the sedimented ways in which we reinvent ourselves, this exhibition traces, well this exhibition and conference trace um, the continued legacy of rock art and its varied manifestations today, unpacking the similarities and differences that emerged over time in different parts of the world, whilst pointing to a p the possibility of a shared origin. It asks where we would be were it not for the first person who left their mark on a rock in the Blombos Cave some 70,000 years back. How different might our sense of self have been were it not for the individual who decided to leave their handprint on the wall of the Chauvet de Pont d'Arc cave in southern France, a gesture which seems to foreshadow the thumbprint as the surest mark of individuality. Would we be in the current predicament that we're in were it not for these early surface incisions? And how might we conceive of such symbols in light of our current data-driven age? Will future generations be equally baffled by the various data storage systems used today? Strange aluminium boxes whose contents, owing to rapid advances in platforms and programs uh, and programming languages, may come to resemble naught but meaningless code? What will they make of our road signs, logos, branded clothes, and social media accounts? Um, some of these questions and the ideas which underpin them are uh, the sort of focus of the various panel discussions and film screenings we have today. And this is the first time that we've actually been able to bring the various scholars and artists involved in this project together in a platform to be able to share their ideas and speak about their work. So we're very excited to share that with you. Um, in terms of the program, we're going to start with a screening of uh, Cherubiket, Cinematic Expedition to the Center of the Earth, uh, which was directed by Carlos Ochoa Ramirez. Um, the film Cherubiket uh, focuses on the archaeological site of Cherubiket in Colombia. It was declared a cultural and biological world heritage site by UNESCO in 2018, um, being named by the archaeology of Latin America as the Sistine Chapel of the Amazon. And over 75,000 rock pictographics have been made by indigenous people on the walls of the 60 rock shelters from 20,000 BCE and are still made nowadays by the uncontacted peoples protected by the national park. These paintings depict hunting scenes, battles, dances and ceremonies, as well as fauna and flora uh, species with a particular uh, emphasis on the worship of the jaguar, a symbol of power and fertility. Such practices are thought to reflect a coherent system of thousand-year-old sacred beliefs, organizing and explaining the relations between the cosmos, nature, and man. The indigenous communities, which are not directly present on the site, consider Chiribiket as a sacred place that cannot be visited and that should be preserved and, uh, and unaltered. Um, just to say that for those joining us online, that while we screen Chiribiket for the audiences that are live, we're going to show the documentary that was produced, uh, which includes footage from Chiribiket, but also of the various artists and scholars involved in the project. And yeah, thanks once again for joining us. Uh, at one o'clock, we'll have another uh, conversation titled Human Witness with Diana Vives, Maria Pia Falci of Argentina and Dr. Marcela Sepulveda from Chile. Um, the next screenings will also be broadcast online. Um, the first being Rock Art in Puebla, Mexico, and the second by Romain Lahaye. Um, at three, uh, sorry, at 2.45, uh, the organizing principle will be our second talk. That includes the artist Angela Ferreira, uh, as well as Richard Forbes and Mila Samoas de Abreu. 
And at 4 p.m., uh, we'll start the conversation of cellular syntax with Carl Bijou, Inga Somdiala, and Jesus Maragon Lobon. Um, so, yeah, thanks once again, and we'll see you in a bit. Rock art predates language, our ability to name, classify, describe, and effectively communicate with others. Aside from the figurative, the symbols found therein, asterisks, dots, half circles, lines, claviforms, cross hatches, spirals, triangles, et al., may well prefigure the graphic systems used to develop the written word, enabling information to pass from one generation to the next. Speaking about the rock art of Europe, for example, Genevieve von Pitzinger makes the astounding observation that only 32 signs have been discovered throughout the entire continent over a 30,000 year period. The implication is that such marks were not random, but represent a complex system of communication, the meaning and purpose of which is subject to ongoing debate. What did these marks mean, and who was their intended audience? One might be tempted to think that our ancient ancestors were trying to tell us something, in the manner, say, of those tasked with developing future-proof warning labels for nuclear waste deposits, or those who sent messages into outer space on Voyager 1 and 2. We cannot say for sure. What we do know is that the emergence of rock art, or more broadly, marks and engravings on rock, signals a pivotal moment in the history of our species, running hand in hand with the realization that one thing can be used to represent another. When you hear a word, you usually think of an image to go along with it. For example, if you hear the word hand, you might think of the image of a hand. But when you see a hand drawn or photographed, it becomes a more permanent image. In the same way, ancient people would take pigment and make an imprint on a rock to eternalize a hand image. Drawing or photographing a natural form such as a hand gives it a permanent place in the universe. I found layers an incredibly compelling holding theme um, in terms of referring to the stratifications that sit under the skin of things, you know, that accrue, that erode, that fold into each other. And stone has this capacity to store data, whether it's about its own formation or about the, um, the information that is inscribed in it, the cultural data. So working with rock art is a wonderful way of engaging the past and while at first this may seem like an invitation to look at their insides that haven't been seen for hundreds of millions of years there's also the sense that they're looking back at you and asking you to consider what it is that they have seen uh, as they've lain on earth for eons um, you know beyond recorded time and so all our yesterdays is also about stones as witnesses and about a universe that perhaps doesn't need a human witness. I love the composition, the substances, the way the earth was stuck together and deformed and formed around that cradle of humankind and especially around Nigh rocks because that's where I sometimes stay so I can watch things. And I was just lying there on, in, in the farmer's, Mr. Somebody's farm on the side of the road. So we have a nice road right through to Stagfontein from Nigh rocks. And these things that are lying on the side of the road, we, we had a look at them and some of them contain brickia. Brickia is the substance, the little bits of broken stone that were cemented together in history. They were cemented together to form the things from which many of the fossils can be, can be scratched and dug. And if you, if you break up some of these rocks, you will probably find some fossils. You've got many ways to study rock art. You can approach it by technical ways, by taking a lot of pictures, by studying it, by ethnographic analogies, by the phylogeny of myths, 
and all these studies provide valuable information on a particular facet of some rock art traditions. Because all these sites are particularly difficult to access, we have to crawl to bring EV equipment. Our team tried to reproduce the caves in three dimensions, so we can go back virtually whenever we want. I also have the chance to work on South African rock art, especially in the Drakensberg Park. But here as well, sites are really difficult to reach. Then I managed to go even a little bit further, trying to bring in my pocket the wall site, with all its iconographic details, all the volume and every crack on the rocky wall. For that, I take thousands and thousands of pictures, I put them in a software which recreates a giant 3D model, then I can generate a huge and really accurate mosaic of all these pictures and study the paintings from my office in France. Rock art informs us about the biodiversity and particular animals from each region in the past, but from a narrative perspective we can interpret some relevant forms of human-animal interactions and understand, for example, the complex and different processes that were conducted in the past for camelid domestication. In terms of locations, paintings were generally realized inside rock shelters of different sizes or just outside, engravings were placed commonly in the face of rocky blocks Geoglyphs cover hill slopes and achieve high visibility, although they can be found on flat surface, making them difficult to perceive. Your first, your first um, experiences of life, you are trying to orientate yourself to your world. So everything goes in your mouth. That's the first thing. Right? So then from there, it's about touch. So you touch everything. So that kind of carries on and then you are robots, you start tumbling around and touching your toes and doing all kinds of things. And then you want to leave a mark. You want to extend yourself beyond your own body and you start leaving marks. And if you get hold of a crayon or something, you're going to scribble all over the wall, over the floors. You're going to take sometimes babies, their feces, and they will actually make <laughs> lines with them. So it's been from the dawn of being human and consciousness, I would imagine, that we've wanted to leave marks behind. And that's obviously one of the reasons why man has left their marks, sometimes consciously and sometimes less so. So for me, the idea of rock art, that's one inclination, I would imagine. I'm not an expert in rock art, but that's just what I think. And then obviously the uh, idea of uh, communicating with others, whether you are shaman, whether your role within a particular community is about communicating ideas, you've been given some, some messages or you've dreamt them, how do you communicate that? sometimes by words, but sometimes you need to, to kind of leave them off. But sometimes it's a direct um, interpretation of an idea, or if it's subconscious, if it's meditative. de todos estos grupos ven en el jaguar la figura muy sagrada de este animal que es el dueño de todos los animales que vive en esta maloca donde el padre sol aparece montado en su canoa cósmica que es la vía láctea con su báculo buscando el sitio más propicio para dar 
inicio y origen a los hombres, a los animales, a las plantas y a todos los elementos que conocemos. Y en ese primer hueco, hecho con la presión de su báculo sobre la superficie de la tierra, bota su poder seminal para poder crear y hacer la procreación energética más importante que da como resultado el nacimiento de una primera creación que es la luna y el sol tiene relaciones insectuosas con ellas de ese acto sexual el sol con la luna nace una criatura que es ni más ni menos que el jaguar por eso los jaguares son amarillos o sea solares por encima y blancos o lunares por debajo I'm saying about like about like how quickly how quickly I'm able to look at images, right? Like well, how how quickly I I realize now how quickly I can read them. Um, it concerns me sometimes, you know, where it's like like this, <laughs> and I'm like hardly looking, and I'm just like a couple of seconds, couple of seconds, couple of seconds. Um, but I think there's something that holds me a little bit longer when I don't know and I need to figure it out. I think this even happens in real life, you know, when when you see something but you're not sure what you see, it, it kind of makes you want to sort of look a bit closer and be like, oh, what is actually going on? I think I'm, I'm way more interested in that. I think that holds me a bit longer than like seeing something and reading it and going, you know. Um, yeah, I'm way more interested in that stuff that I, I might not understand. I'm more interested in that, in that space that there is between me and getting the thing and making sense of it, defining it, knowing it in, 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 in certain ways, I don't know. I'm trying to understand what language does in that whole identity making and culture thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and maybe to try and like capture that experience of like, you know, trying to read a language that you don't understand where that gap is, where you recognize text and you recognize writing, you could, you know, there's a specific format, there's a specific sort of quality about this thing um, that reminds you of text. There's a level of like it being familiar, but also strange at the same time. Um, but it's that gap for me that's really interesting where you just, there's just, I, I suppose, just space between you and the thing and you can't like make it up. Um, I find that really interesting. I think that's a very interesting generative space. But yeah, I mean, I, I think there's there's that as well. There's a sense that, like, in a similar fashion, like that that kind of gap that we experience in sort of language, potentially, or in abstraction, so to speak, is like I guess maybe the the element of time there insofar as rock art is concerned, right? If, if you want to talk about its potential romanticization, probably, yeah. Very observable romanticization, <laughs> um, There's just a gap. And, and maybe I'm like not really interested also in, in sort of making it intelligible. Um, I, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a, I hate to say it in like a really binary way, you know, to say that it's Western or whatever as a sort of philosophical or just the way of viewing the world or wanting to sort of make definitions and understand something within a very specific set of ways of knowing it. Um, but I think, yeah, I don't know. There's like space for us not to potentially, to like not know the thing and to just let it be in a way, to let it be its own thing, um, to let it behave how it behaves, which is something I've been saying a lot about, like how I want to treat the, the pigment that I'm using. Mm -hmm. um. My research is especially focused in the artistic process of rock art itself. This is to say, I try to reconstruct the rock art 
analyzing the archaeological remains related with artistic creation and by means of a controller experimental approach. The aim is to better know the complexity of the whole processes related with this activity and to calculate the social investment in order to specify the role of rock art in prehistoric societies. Rock art is one of the most striking legacy in prehistoric Spain. Hundreds of caves, rock shelters and open air sites were decorated along the whole territory. It is not worthy the case of the cave of Altamira because it was the first one discovered in 1879. But also all northern Spain has the biggest density of Paleolithic art worldwide. On the other side, the Mediterranean region is well known by the post-Paleolithic paintings and rock shelters. Uh, all this unique heritage is recognized by the UNESCO as World Heritage. This is uh, a variety of places where you can find rock art in this place. Um, walls, little holes, sometimes rock art is very small, like a couple of centimeters, and sometimes in some kind of shelters, and only very special, only in one or two situations, in, we have engravings on boulders. The most important thing that is uh, represented in the whole area are the llamas, because llamas were the, the center of the economy of these people. They are painted in every position, in every situation, and everywhere. Also, for this period, we have representations of battles, men with arms facing each other with bows and arrows with, in, in very um, confrontative. Today, studying rock art is very relevant because not only do we come from it, but because it has saved us by bringing us to this precise moment and recreates us on the planet as an intelligent species. The four regions that I have studied, present a series of very important examples of what has been said, the first is the association between anthropomorphs and zoomorphs with three fingers or phalanges and rectilinear or quadrangular figures, such as the sites of Durango, Mexico, Cueva Pinta, border with Chihuahua, Sinaloa, Cerro El Cochi, and Puebla, Tejalpa. This association is possibly the expression of a code that is integrated into the Yutnahua or Yaddo Aztecan linguistic trunk. The last element is the representation of Hopi women from the southwestern United States with butterfly or side bun hairstyles, and its influence or fashion for this form of hairstyle is clear because it appears both at the Rincon de los Apache site in Chihuahua and in San Pablo Amal Tepec in Puebla, both in Mexico. The latest discoveries made by our research in the south of Puebla, in the Tejalpa site and in the Sierra Norte of Puebla, are rather surprising, since the representation of the cactus called peyote, Lafafora williamsi, has been verified both in painting and in engraving on rocky surfaces from sites such as Cueva de los Muncos and Monticelli Huitamilco, the latter with a peyote represented with one of its segments bitten off. Peyote contains mescaline, a psychotropic substance that has been traditionally used since ancient times in religious and healing ceremonies by indigenous groups in the southwestern United States and western and northern Mexico. In Chihuahua, for example, there are two very important sites with cave paintings of peyotes represented in profile and in plan. This is the case of Cueva de las Monas and Canada El Café, with one of its peyotes bitten as well. Like many researchers working in this field, I believe it's highly likely that the geometric patterns that we see in early human rock art from around the world are physical transcriptions of visual hallucinations experienced in a state of trance. I'm interested in the idea of extended cognition, that thinking is not something that happens in the brain, that thinking extends out through the body into the material substance of the world and back in a constantly evolving reciprocal process. We transform materials, and the materials transform us in return. The concave marks in changing my mind were made in an attempt to describe a grid of points using a hammer and punch with my eyes closed. Looking at the indentations in the work now, it seems as though the fingertips of my mind have pressed into the surface of the stone, 
an echo of our ancestors and the emergence of human consciousness as we know it today. The hand has enabled the mind to manifest in the world and has led us to where we are now. We're hybridized with our technologies, we inhabit virtual realities, and we could be on the brink of developing artificial intelligence that exceeds our own. Evolution moves through us like an invisible wave. I'm so curious about the way each one of these elements works against the surface of the other and how they add more meaning and more history and memory to each other. So in the way that the water carries the rust into the surface of the stone. And the rust is created because the water or the moisture is on the surface of the steel. So the cycle transfers from the water, from the rust to the water, from the water to the stone. And the element of iron lives in relation to the stone. We find it in the ground, perhaps not in the marble, but it is a relative of that marble. So there's something cyclical happening there. And then there's also a, a beauty in the way that they rub against each other and over time cause patina and polish. Uh, and I think in, in the way that these three works in this set, reverence one, two and three are a homage to those elements and also a memory of everything that lives because everything lives. It goes without saying that the scale of urbanization, agriculture, industrialization, etc. would not have been possible without a language or system such as rock art around which ideas could be expressed, preserved, bettered. In this way, the study of rock art provides crucial insights, not only into the world of our ancestors, but our present and future.
Rock art predates language, our ability to name, classify, describe and effectively communicate with others. Aside from the figurative, the symbols found therein, asterisks, dots, half circles, lines, claviforms, cross hatches, spirals, triangles et al, may well prefigure the graphic systems used to develop the written word, enabling information to pass from one generation to the next. Speaking about the rock art of Europe, for example, Genevieve von Pitzinger makes the astounding observation that only 32 signs have been discovered throughout the entire continent over a 30,000 year period. The implication is that such marks were not random, but represent a complex system of communication, the meaning and purpose of which is subject to ongoing debate. What did these marks mean, and who was their intended audience? One might be tempted to think that our ancient ancestors were trying to tell us something, in the manner, say, of those tasked with developing future-proof warning labels for nuclear waste deposits, or those who sent messages into outer space on Voyager 1 and 2. We cannot say for sure. What we do know is that the emergence of rock art, or more broadly, marks and engravings on rock, signals a pivotal moment in the history of our species, running hand in hand with the realization that one thing can be used to represent another. When you hear a word, you usually think of an image to go along with it. For example, if you hear the word hand, you might think of the image of a hand. But when you see a hand drawn or photographed, it becomes a more permanent image. In the same way, ancient people would take pigment and make an imprint on a rock to eternalize a hand image. Drawing or photographing a natural form such as a hand gives it a permanent place in the universe. I found layers an incredibly compelling holding theme um, in terms of referring to the stratifications that sit under the skin of things, you know, that accrue, that erode, that fold into each other. And stone has this capacity to store data, whether it's about its own formation or about the, um, the information that is inscribed in it, the cultural data. So working with rock art is a wonderful way of engaging the past and while at first this may seem like an invitation to look at their insides that haven't been seen for hundreds of millions of years there's also the sense that they are looking back at you and asking you to consider what it is that they have seen uh, as they've lain on earth for eons um, you know beyond recorded time and so all our yesterdays is also about stones as witnesses and about a universe that perhaps doesn't need a human witness. I love the for composition, the substances, the way the earth was stuck together and deformed and formed around that cradle of humankind and especially around Nigh rocks because that's where I sometimes stay so I can watch things. And I was just lying there on, in, in the farmer's, Mr. Somebody's farm on the side of the road. So we have a nice road right through to Stagfontein from Nigh rocks. And these things that are lying on the side of the road, we, we had a look at them and some of them contain brickia. Brickia is the substance, the little bits of broken stone that were cemented together in history. They were cemented together to form the things from which many of the fossils can be, can be scratched and dug. And if you, if you break up some of these rocks, you will probably find some fossils. You've got many ways to study rock art. You can approach it by technical ways, by taking a lot of pictures, by studying it, by ethnographic analogies, by the phylogeny of myths, and all these studies provide valuable information on a particular facet of some rock art traditions. Because all these sites are particularly difficult to access, we have to crawl to bring heavy equipment. 
our team try to reproduce the caves in three dimensions so we can go back virtually whenever we want. I also have the chance to work on South African rock art, especially in the Drakensberg Park. But here as well, sites are really difficult to reach. Then I managed to go even a little bit further, trying to bring in my pocket the wall site, with all its iconographic details, all the volume and every crack on the rocky wall. For that, I take thousands and thousands of pictures, I put them in a software which recreate a giant 3D model, then I can generate a huge and really accurate mosaic of all these pictures and study the paintings from my office in France. Rock art informs us about the biodiversity and particular animals from each region in the past, but from a narrative perspective we can interpret some relevant forms of human-animal interactions and understand, for example, the complex and different processes that were conducted in the past for camelid domestication. In terms of locations, paintings were generally realized inside rock shelters of different sizes or just outside, engravings were placed commonly in the face of rocky blocks, geoglyphs cover hill slopes and achieve high visibility although they can be found on flat surface, making them difficult to perceive. Your first, your first um, experiences of life, you are trying to orientate yourself to your world. So everything goes in your mouth. That's the first thing. Right? So then from there, it's about touch. So you touch everything. And so that kind of carries on and then you are robust. You start tumbling around and touching your toes and doing all kinds of things. And then you want to leave a mark. You want to extend yourself beyond your own body and you start leaving marks and if you get hold of crayon or something you're going to scribble all over the wall, over the floors you're going to take sometimes babies, their feces and they will actually make <laughs> lines with them so it's been from the dawn of being human and consciousness I would imagine that we've wanted to leave marks behind and that's obviously one of the reasons why man has left their marks, sometimes consciously and sometimes less so. So for me the idea of rock art, that's one inclination I would imagine. I'm not an expert in rock art, but that's just what I think. And then obviously the uh, idea of uh, communicating with others, whether you are shaman, whether your role within a particular community is about communicating ideas, you've been given some some messages or you've dreamt them, how do you communicate that? Sometimes by words, but sometimes you need to to kind of leave them off. But sometimes it's a direct um, interpretation of an idea or if it's subconscious, if it's meditative. de todos estos grupos ven en el jaguar la figura muy sagrada de este animal que es el dueño de todos los animales que vive en esta maloca donde el padre sol aparece montado en su canoa cósmica que es la vía láctea con su báculo buscando el sitio más propicio para dar inicio y origen a los hombres a los animales, a las plantas y a todos los elementos que conocemos. Y en ese primer hueco, hecho con la presión de su báculo sobre la superficie de la tierra, bota su poder seminal para poder crear y hacer la procreación 
energética más importante que da como resultado el nacimiento de una primera creación que es la luna y el sol tiene relaciones insectuosas con ellas de ese acto sexual el sol con la luna nace una criatura que es ni más ni menos que el jaguar por eso los jaguares son amarillos o sea solares por encima y blancos o lunares por debajo I'm saying about like about like how quickly how quickly I'm able to look at images, right? Like or how how quickly I I realize now how quickly I can read them. Um, it concerns me sometimes, you know, where it's like like this, <laughs> and I'm like hardly looking, and I'm just like couple of seconds, couple of seconds, couple of seconds. Um, but I think there's something that holds me a little bit longer when I don't know and I need to figure it out. I think this even happens in real life, you know. When, When you see something but you're not sure what you see, it, it kind of makes you want to sort of look a bit closer and be like, oh, what is actually going on? I think I'm, I'm way more interested in that. I think that holds me a bit longer than like seeing something and reading it and going, you know. Um, yeah, I'm way more interested in that stuff that I, I might not understand. I'm more interested in that, in that space that there is between me and getting the thing and making sense of it, defining it, knowing it in, 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 in certain ways, I don't know. I'm trying to understand what language does in that whole identity making and culture thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and maybe to try and like capture that experience of like, you know, trying to read a language that you don't understand where that gap is, where you recognize text and you recognize writing, you could, you know, there's a specific format, there's a specific sort of quality about this thing um, that reminds you of text. There's a level of like it being familiar, but also strange at the same time. Um, but it's that gap for me that's really interesting where you just, there's just, I, I suppose, just space between you and the thing and you can't like make it up. Um, I find that really interesting. I think that's a very interesting generative space. But yeah, I mean, I, I think there's there's that as well. There's a sense that, like, in a similar fashion, like that that kind of gap that we experience in sort of language, potentially, or in abstraction, so to speak, is like I guess maybe the the element of time there.
to thank Diana Vives, uh, Maria Piafalci, and Dr. Marcela Sepulveda um, from Argentina and, and Chile, respectively, for, for joining us. Uh, the title of this discussion is uh, Human Witness, um, and the focus is about uh, really the capacity of stones to store data, be it cultural or otherwise, uh, the de desire to leave one's mark for posterity, and how contemporary approaches to the study of rock art might grapple with the unknown, that fine line between trying to understand or make sense, make something intelligible, versus the acknowledgement there is, that there is much we still and will not ever know. And um, so we've just showed a, a film, uh, Cherubiquet Cinemat Cinematic Cinematographic Expedition to the Center of the Earth, which was directed by Carlos Ochoa Ramirez um, about Cherubiquet in Colombia. And one of the things that came up in, in that discussion, well, in that film, um, was this idea. There was a scene in which um, someone was studying bats, and he was explaining his reason for, for doing it, and he was sitting there dissecting in the middle of Cherubiquet jungle this bat uh, for research purposes, for future posterity. Um, and what he said was that we never know. Um, if, if we do not do what we're currently doing, we will never know. <laughs> he yeah. said, if we never knew, nothing happened, in the sense that um, life happens on the planet or in the universe, but um, the humans interpret it and record it, but we only know that much. And so if we don't know, it didn't happen. That's our reality as humans. And then the rocks obviously hold an entirely different, deeper truth, which we may never completely divine. So I think he was meaning it also in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, I found the, um, the documentary very moving, um, also because it was unfiltered. You really felt that you were there with the, um, with the scientists. And it's interesting that they're at a rock face of a time where that was all there was. There were no scientists, no curators, no artists. They were all one and the same. And here we are again at the same rock face today from all our different disciplines actually addressing the same questions, looking at the past and the future. So it's, it's very interesting in that sense to have rock art mediate these discussions. Um, one of the, yeah, I mean, one of the points, obviously the idea of being a, a human witness and what this means to each of you in your respective practices, what it means to approach a site uh, where you find Art, where you're studying, what it means to study it, interpret it, um, go on these lengthy expeditions, um, and really sort of immerse in it. One of one of the artworks that I wanted to show um, both of you um, that Diana produced is called All Our Yesterdays, and that artwork is essentially three or four. I mean, it's ongoing. You've done it with multiple rocks mm. and different rock types, but it's essentially a, um, different rocks which have had holes cut out from the center, um, that then, uh, let me sh uh, share screen for you. Um, I'm gonna do it here. Well, are you going to show the picture that was on the invitation? So maybe I can speak to that already. So those three stones, there was a quartz, a sandstone, and a dolerite. And I had, um, I extracted their core by drilling into them and exposed their insides. So there's the sense of curiosity to look at surfaces that haven't been seen in millions of years. Um, but at the same time, have you got them up? So you have the dolerite. I don't need to explain to the geologists, but <laughs> the, the dolerite, the sandstone, and the quartz. And um, the, the idea is that you're looking into time, and you're looking into things that lie around us, but we are never able to see into them. And even if we break them open, there's an infinite amount of breaking that we can do without ever really knowing them. So the, 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 with the magnifying glass, there's this idea of it invites inspection. But at the same time, they become like seers. They are looking back at you. 
And it's a gaze that has actually happened before my intervention with the rock since the beginning of time when they lay on the earth and they have looked at everything that passed overhead. So there is this idea of stones as silent witnesses that are beyond human witnesses and an earth that is, is that actually is composed, if you think about it, it's a, we are on a rock, rock is beneath us, it is also in space and we are, in a way rocks are like, for me, the bones of, of the earth. Yeah, so that was all our yesterdays. <laughs> I mean, yeah, one of the... Oh, one thing I should mention is that um, the other ones were extracted with a core drill, but this one here I drilled with further marks, and the marks looked like um, fossil marks, and people were fascinated by this who didn't know what they were, and they said, oh, what, you know, what kind of animal is this? And I said, well, these are really the fossils of the future because it, they are the marks of human intervention, and one day there will be fossilized marks of our intervention on the surface of the earth. Um, and the other thing also is that people wondered at these beautiful things and said, where did you find them? And the answer really is that I found them on the mountain, in a field, on a farm, and they're all around us, but very often um, the intervention of the artist is to take a, a rock and make it into a stone and represent it, but it's all around us all the time. The one... Um the one thing I wanted to ask each of you, and I'm just going to try stop the screen share quickly. Um, you know, there is the, on the one hand this attention to surface, um, th what is on the surface of the rock, and then on the other, a desire to sort of dig deeper um, back into time, into histories, cultures. And I wanted to ask on a on a personal level um, from each of you, Maria and um, Marcelo. Um, what the study of rock art does for you uh, and, and what drew you to, to rock art in the first place? Well, um, I, I study rock art and I feel that when I'm asking questions to the stone, because that's what I do. I, I stand up in front of the rock, in front of the representations, and all the signs that are painted or engraved on the stone. And I, I ask questions to the stone. But at the same time, I feel, I feel that, that someone has to say something to me. And this is what I think Diana wanted to say, that um, I, I don't think it's a one-way question. I think it's both ways. The past is talking to me, and I, I am asking to the past. And I think this is like the magnifying glass that she showed. This is what science do. It, uh, tries to, science tries to find those details that can tell us what happened in the past. Uh, meaning is another world. We, we really don't know what those representations meant to those people, but we do know that there is some kind of information that we have to discover in, in those representations. I, I agree with you, say, Maria, because it's difficult to us to know what image once means. And uh, um, when, we are, when we discover rock art, it's always an amazing moment because we are in face in front of the past, no? But we are in the present, mm -hmm. in now and our interpretation is always from us, from now, and we need to know that uh, the interpretation is from us. Uh, and I have a, a particular history, and it's not always the same interpretation for our people, for our communities. So it's 
now we must try to share this uh, interpretation and in uh, in my approach I always try to combine several uh, perspectives from place, from landscape, from images, but also from materials because something that is very important, I work on rock art paintings, uh, not engraving or other expression, but we have the permanence of the material, the interaction of between paintings and rock, and I want to know what were the intention of the artist or people in the past to uh, interact with uh, all this uh, assemblage of images, materials, landscape. Why? <laughs> I, we are not always sure, but we try to combine several aspects. Yes, that's, that's very well said. Um, I always like to think as an artist working with rock that, or stone is that I'm working with the past as an active aspect of the present. That's very much what you said. Yeah, completely. I mean, one of, one of the things we mentioned, you mentioned just before um, the, the panel began was this how, how different fields have sort of branched out to become very specialized and perhaps uh, isolated. Um, and one of the things that was um, you know, fruitful for us in thinking through this project was how to bring um, different researchers from different parts of the world together alongside artists and scholars who uh, uh, have a, a shared interest uh, in, various, in various things related to rock art. Um, but going back to you know, the idea of, and I think this is where the thing itself comes into this picture as well, it's this kind of echo, this yes. constant past yes. in the present. You could maybe talk about that work. Do you have a picture of it? Sure. Yeah. Just so that I don't yeah. have to explain it. So um, when, when Sven um, wrote first about the Layers exhibition, it had a lot to do with, um, with something that goes beyond the origin of language for us, because in rock art you have images that are used to represent a thing and they are intelligible to us no matter what language we speak but then we fragmented into so many languages and so the idea of the gap between the thing and or the object and and its inherent meaning and language is one that exists in many ways to our detriment today so I did a work called The Thing Itself, which is titled after um, an idea that Virginia Woolf chases in Orlando. And it has uh, placed on a lithostone a, um, three different versions of a whale's ear bone. The first is a fossil, an original fossil, which is about 15 million years old. And it is effectively a cavity that has been filled by the seabed's memory of the whale's ear bone with, with shell, with sand. And, um, and it has this poetic ability to also make us think of the, the songs that the whales heard in oceans of the past because they can hear over thousands and thousands of miles and these were different oceans. And then the second one is cast in glass and the third is printed in 3D from um, carbon, carbon fiber. So I used the litho stone, which is also working with, with stone as a, in terms of its history and consequence and materiality that recalls the book and its proportions, and um, also the tradition of inscribing knowledge in stones and the evolution into printmaking and image multiples, and, um, and the book, and now the internet, which has actually called, caused almost the disappearance of the book, which becomes itself a fossil again. <laughs> um, but then there's also the idea of the three ages of information technology, um, which you have presenced here because with the fossil you have the artisanal which is in one location made as a unique object then you have the mechanical which is the mold in the glass and then you have the new age of the digital which will place us in entirely different coordinates and the the interesting thing maybe about the glass is that it's molded 
And in many ways, that to me is the one that represents most our language because we, with language, we are only ever able to circumscribe the object and to fill it with some form of substance, but never to represent it. And, and this is where rock art is so wonderful because you go back to the beginnings of not even knowing whether we know the intent of what was drawn, but we can see what it is trying to represent. So, I mean, yeah. there's that mm -hmm. idea of, you know, again, going back to the beginning of the discussion where nothing happened. If it hasn't been recorded, yes. nothing happened. Mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting things through this experience, you know, the various images um, m that have been shared with me um, is that so much of the study of rock art today, especially because these places are inaccessible for the most part, especially because deforestation, urbanization are having an impact on them and you know, the need to preserve them is increasingly apparent, but a lot of that preservation requires a, um, a digital, you know, it's, it's cataloging, photographing, coming up with Photoshop renditions of or recreating them. And what becomes interesting for me here is the extent to which those archives and the digital archives become the only sort of repository of information. Um, so I'm just going to remove the, this. Yes, and it's in a way a paradox because one of the primary properties of rock art, um, either you know on walls or in caves, is that it's very often, as we've seen in the documentary, uh, inaccessible, and it's embedded in landscape that is difficult to reach, and so people have to go to the work, and that in itself, that journey, I think that it. You know, we always talk about transforming things, but they transform us in turn. You could hear it with the documentary filmmaker when mm. he put down his camera and he said, I just have to be here. And how, yeah. Thanks. So, and, but even with working with rocks, um, the work that Willem Bossoff does, the things at Nye Rocks, they're heavy. You have to go to them. You can't carry them around and they're not, they're not portable. They, mm. they require a presence. Mm. How, I mean, how is that distinction for you guys between... Um, going to the site to experience the work, the kind of data that is stored there that you can only really experience in person versus what I imagine is a kind of post-site uh, post visit research. There's nothing that, um, that, that compares with being actually at the site. I can tell you a lot about the site and I have to uh, make uh, something, say something about what uh, she said, that uh, not all rock art is in a, unaccessible. In Argentina we have thousands of rock art sites and some of them are very easy to reach. They, they are not uh, in the middle of the jungle, like, let's say, like Chiribiteque. Mm -hmm. um, but there is Something that I'd like to, to to think about is the the stone. We're we're talking about a lot of rock, the rock itself. Apart from the art, the rock, the stone. And I think, in my opinion, uh, that rock is part of the creation. When when I choose a certain rock, a certain place, a certain surface to make a representation, to engrave or paint something there and not in another place. Mm -hmm. It's because I am, I am trying to say something also there. Mm -hmm. And the rock is important. It's not that I am um, that people in the past I make drawings or images anywhere. They, they choose especially certain rocks and certain places, and that's important. Mm -hmm. And I work in a place uh, where it's actually full of rocks. But rock art is just in certain places. It's not that if there is rock available, I will do rock art, whatever. Um, so, trying to understand those places, those locations, and also what Marcella said, uh, combine with other um, information like um, 
all the material processes and the, of course, all the archaeological record that comes with, with rock art. Rock art is just one piece of the archaeological record. So you don't have to think about rock art isolated from other things of the past. It was part of the life of the past with many other things mm -hmm. that we also try to understand. It's like fossil. We always say it's the fossil. All right. but yes, that's absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I'm speaking as an artist and without the background that um, the, the scientists have of, of rock art. Um, so I wasn't trying to imply that, that it's always inaccessible. But when one does have a, a sense of having to, to go and discover it, however. But I also remember seeing this. Um, we're speaking about rock art on the, in the Southern Hemisphere for the most part, I think. But um, I saw an amazing uh, exhibition of, at Stonehenge, and they were talking about how rock art is also about connectivity, and they were talking about three different types of connection to the natural world and to the heavens and to the community, the campfire, and the idea of the dissemination of language. So, yes, it happened at the intersection of all sorts of things that one should look at when speaking of rock art or looking at it. I mean, yeah, what interest, uh, I'm really interested in what you're saying, uh, Maria, about the stone being so integral, because what happens when, you know, when we think about it or treat it as a substrate just for the, the artwork, the paintings, uh, we tend to lose sight of what you're saying, of the, the importance of, of sight, S-I-T-E, in this context. Um, and yeah, I mean, what what happens hypothetically in the future when a lot of these sites have been destroyed and uh, we're left with the digital footprint? Uh, is there a lot of, I mean, all of the research, like you're saying, kind of research you're doing, which goes into trying to code these particular places to bring out information that's specific to place, um, I'm, I'm quite interested in how, how both of you are also engaging that aspect of it and trying to sort of preserve or record uh, a larger context. Obviously, there's a lot of time that has passed since the time of making for some of these paintings and the present, but I imagine there's a kind of cataloging process that happens in recording the various changes that happen over time. Um, to exist alongside sort of the photographic documentation of the work. <laughs> um, you must know that it's always happened. We had, we had already lost lots of rock art in the world, in our region, uh, and not just today or in the 16th century when conquest, <laughs> Spanish conquest, right? No way. They destroyed lots of rock art sites, but now we have also rally and lots of uh, restriction of sites, mining, and lots of extractive process that are destroying sites every day. No, so. What we must do is to know that we have a responsibility now. And what we are trying to do also is to make a record to, have to construct a, a kind of memory of today. Because we know that tomorrow it may be not exist. So, uh, and we can also compare what a record, what photography maybe 50 years ago or 20 years ago now we use for example photogrammetry we have 3d recording and it's lots of information new information gigabytes <laughs> so we ha also need a uh, new technology and we have new te technology but and we must work with it and we must to run sometimes to record the rock art big site because they are always uh, amenazas. Um, I don't Threats. know how to say amenazas. Threats. 
Ah, eso. No. Eh, that's why it's not, of course, recording rock art. It's not the same experience to be there, but we must do. Can I ask um, Maria, Pia, and, and Marcella, where do you see the role of art in assisting what you're doing? Sorry, again? Um, I, was, I, I was asking both of you, um, because I'm here as an artist, and there are a few other artists in the audience who partook in the exhibition. Where do you see the role of art in assisting what you're doing in the in the recording of, of these things that might be lost? I, in my opinion, um, the artist's view or the artist's knowledge of how to do things, for example, painting, how to make a paint, how to draw, how to pack the stone, how to deal with materials. Uh, it's very important. and. But at the same time, um, rock art is not art as we understand it today. It's a different kind of thing. It's, a, it's a, it was a part of a system of information um, that um, change, changed um, meanings through time. We have some places that have been um, painted for more than 7,000 years in Patagonia, for example. So um, the, the interaction between the past also, it happened because the person that painted 7,000 years ago, it was not the same person that painted 4,000 years ago. So we have there also an interaction between artists in the past. Um, and I think um, the, the, the view, because sometimes we as scientists are very tough, very, very straight. We, we need to record data and, and, and do everything and keep everything very, very detailed and, and perhaps an artist helps us to broad uh, is that correct to, to broad our view to, to, to open our eyes mm. into different things mm. not only data which we are as scientists are very very excited about <laughs> oh, but you <laughs> very, see yeah. that's well but it's important documentation because yeah. that's part of the we have to do because mm. we know that all these sites are in danger mm. so we know that we have to do it but at the same time, to understand rock art, mm. we also need another view. Mm. So I think it's a bit of both, mm. that it's playing there. <laughs> yes, I, I think the, the, the yes, yes. So the, the idea is also we, the, the exchange have, is fertile. Yeah. Marcella, sorry, I didn't we have to. some We have some experience with artists here in the north, in where I work. Uh, with contemporary uh, artists, and we have different uh, type of expression now. And um, some artists play with materials mm -hmm. and their body, for example, mm -hmm. because we have, of course, rock art, but we have a person. So person is movement, mm -hmm. and they work with the aspect of time, of body, of the perception, for example, with color, they make a, a exhibition with a tissue in color, in rock art, in, in, in stone, with stone. So we have also another type of experiment, experience, mm -hmm. experience and experimentation mm -hmm. with aspect that we cannot see as scientists because as Maria said we are very mm. <laughs> closed mm. because we need to make a, all what we record very systematic mm. 
and we see how many animals, how many humans, what type of details, the place, the um, the scene. We can we try to uh, reconstruct what you say, you know, the language. The, there is a code, so we are very close sometimes, and artists can open our mind and to see something that we are not prepared to see, honestly. Well, well, that's, that's wonderful because that's effectively what you tried to do with the Layers exhibition as well. Um, and I hope that there is more of an exchange because I see Richard here in the audience and his work was the one with the marble that absorbs the water that is acquiring rust through its position in the, in the metal bowl. And it made me think of weathering, which over centuries or millennia is what stones are subjected to. So I think artists more and more are not just using stone as you know, material indiscriminately. It has a self-referential quality for us. We actually read your papers. We read what geologists and anthropologists and archaeologists are, are writing about, and we want to position ourselves more and more in a, in a, in a place of understanding um, the, the inherent qualities of the material. And um, I mean, all of art actually is at the intersection of rock art also with the pigments extracted from the earth which come from rocks but also with the advent of fire because correct me if i'm wrong but fire is actually what mediated the entry into caves and the way that some of the drawings were made in the caves and the access to those sites and also the campfire around which we developed community and and language and working memory so for artists and also um the transition to ground sleep is what gave us dreams because it allowed for REM sleep and that is the bedrock of artistic creativity. So artists today are looking at those things and, and we want to know what you're thinking and we want to share more. Do you, do you agree, Richard? Okay, Richard Forbes agrees. <laughs> I mean, I think one of the other interesting overlaps is that your, both of your practices, what you do, um, require a slowing down. And in our kind of frenzied age where information is encoded in everything, you know, um, be it typographic, be it image-based, whatever it might be, um, there is a slowness that is almost required to do what you do. And even that, that tempo it allows for something different to happen, it allows for a different kind of engagement um, where it's perhaps not all about a kind of consumption regurgitation model, but more about, a, like you said, a systematic process where you don't necessarily know where you're going with something, but you begin and, uh, and you've got to be attentive. I think that's, that's quite crucial. Um, that's kind of, yeah, I mean, when I think about all our, yes, uh, all our yesterdays, it it is rem it does kind of remind me of that, and here I'm talking about the initial artwork where you've got the rocks with the, on the one hand, the drill piece that's gone through it that's quickly extracted as sort of a core, but at the same time the millennia that that it exposes and yeah. the various layers of sedimentation that make that rock form. Absolutely, I, I think artists. Um, I mean, there's there's a reductive and an additive process in in working in sculpture, but the any anyone, well, no, I speak for myself. But the material guides, <laughs> the material attracts, and the material guides. So, hey, another question that I wanted to ask, because we saw it now in the film with uh, Cher Beckett, was um, he was uh, one uh, one of the people involved in the expedition was pointing to one of the rock faces and showing a basket um, next to the image of a piranha, and he was saying that this basket. You know, you have to kind of understand, you use your closest sort of cultural understanding or relative to be able to tap into or knowledge of um, other cultures or people from previous generations or what it might be. And that basket for them was a kind of a signifier of sorts because it, it was still used today, even though much many of the communities that use it don't necessarily know how, how far back it goes. Um, well, they do, I'm not sure, but 
It, what interested me there is how you, we, we inherit a lot of things. We don't necessarily know where they come from. And I was wondering, uh, in relation to each of your um, fields of well, your particular sites, your research, how many of those sort of occasions you've come across? I think you're talking about the basket with the piranhas where they were saying that today it's still used to fish a certain yes, kind of fish, exactly. yeah. Well, uh, it's quite difficult sometimes. Um, we, wh where I work, we don't have um, communities, original communities that can tell us something about the past. Um, although we have um, very ancient texts from, for example, the, the first Spaniards that, that came into Argentina or the first um, travelers, and that helps us to understand certain things. But um, I'm, I'm thinking in South Africa that you have also communities um, very interesting studies about how they lived and how they they uh, practice certain uh, ceremonies. So I'm thinking about Louis Williams and all his studies about South African rock art. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't have that. We just have to stick to the to what we see and what we um, have there. And but. Uh, you 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 mentioned one thing that I would like to pick. It's uh, time. Um, artists take time to to do what they have to do: sculpture, painting, engraving, whatever. Um, we also take a lot of time to try to understand rock art. Sometimes. Um, Marcela knows this very well. Uh, I I spent um, a long time ago. I spent nine months uh, recording and and studying the pictures, the, the photographs of just one site, and that ended in just one paper. And and it was nine months that I sat at the computer in front of those pictures and trying to understand what happened there. Then that work helped me to understand a lot of other things. But it's not only the, the time that the artist took to, to make, for example, the paintings. Sometimes, the, Marcela knows this very well, the, the pigments comes from very far away. And and that is also time, a very time consuming work to 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 have it at the at right the the right amount and at the right place and at the right moment. And uh, it's it's time. And sometimes people think that we we work very slow, but at the same time that we look at those pictures and, and go to the site and record we're at the same time thinking and making and, and, and asking more and more questions. It's, it's a process because the more you see, the more you want to know and the more ideas you have about it. So it is good that it takes time. I, I think it's the same with the artist's process. And it, it's, it's, it is, we, we, perhaps we live in a world that everything has to be in, Instagram. And it's not like that. Uh, it it has it it. I I mean, it needs to take time. It's good that it takes a lot of time. That reminds me of the not this documentary, but the one that you had with lots of speakers. There was someone who was showing how they map out in digital form the entire wall with all the fissures and cracks to also decide on or to actually observe where people decided to draw. So that's very much in keeping with what you're saying, this ability to capture and then really think about it. Um, 
and look at the images. So I guess there the digital means have helped. <laughs> um, um, Maria Pia, was it you who mentioned the representations in, uh, with the peyote, the mescaline? I think you spoke about um, rock art in trance states. Was that in the documentary? I think you mentioned it. I think that was Dr. Francisco oh, Mediola Galvan, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and I found very interesting in the rock painting here that there was the white, chalky underworld and obviously always the connection to the stars. Mm. Mm. I mean, um, Maria, you mentioned that Marcella knew uh, something about or um, was quite specialized in the understanding of uh, how particular paints had traveled. Um, that was also something that was really interesting to me because it can give you a sense of mobility and give you an understanding of, you know, if this rock type that was used or this particular ochre uh, only originates in one sort of place and yet it's found in the rocks of here, you can kind of study that and understand the migration of people too. I can answer. <laughs> um. It's in some ca in, in some sites we have pigment next to the site, and they we can see that they not use this pigment, and sometimes they use a pigment which is coming uh, from maybe 100 or more kilometers. Why? Because we don't know. <laughs> There's something maybe symbolic, economic, social aspect, and relation, particular relation and interaction with these tours, with this pigment. We have lots of ethnographic and historic information that announced that they have special relation, maybe taboos or something that's happened now. And that's why it's not so simple to do rock art, because it's not just to see something and reproduce it on the rock, on the surface, on the stone, or in the, in the place. You need a, a, lots of interaction with landscape, materials, and now as scientists, we have lots of techniques. Uh, analytical techniques that could help us, uh, that can help us to identify where are the pigment coming. But we are, we have the data, but we can not always interpret why it's happening. So uh, we use information from people, from a uh, historic information also to understand. We also um, study the road because we see the link be between sites, rock art, and other types of sites. Cemetery, uh, the site where they lived, and we understand that rock art, it's not uh, isolated. It's part of a, v a very complex system, if, you, if we can talk about that, um, of a space, of a landscape, and people move, always, we always move as human, no? And we need to create relation with place. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, I guess um, it's you know what you said earlier about we just don't know. I think like that admission is. Uh, I, I enjoy the idea of sitting with the difficulty of not knowing. Uh, it's something that uh, Inga Sundiala, one of the speakers later today, also speaks about a fair amount. Um, on the one hand, the desire the desire to know, but on the other idea, on the other a kind of acceptance that we don't um, and the various possibilities that come with that as opposed to a, a kind of fixation with finding the answer but a, an openness or receptivity which comes back to all our yesterdays and the idea of uh, recognizing that rocks also speak back. Yeah. I mean he gave, he gave a very, Inga gave a very interesting example of um, 
being able to read a language that you can't understand, because you can read the letters, you can make the sounds, but you don't know what they mean. And in a way, that's a wonderful metaphor for looking at rock art, because we're looking, we're trying to understand, we're trying to look at the variables, but as the experts say, you just are not sure. <laughs> so that, that place of not knowing um, is, is in a way uh, expansive. Um, I think at, at this point, I don't know if there's anything further that, uh, oh, sorry. I don't know if there's anything further you'd like to add here, um, but I, th I also thought we'd have a, a brief opportunity before the, the panel ends to open it up to the audience if there are any um, questions. Um. Can I maybe ask of the two of you one more question? In terms of being here and now today, is this an exciting time for rock art? Is the, is Definitely. The, yeah? <laughs> please, please tell us why so we can get excited. Are you getting better funding? Is there more focus? Are there new discoveries? And will it become more accessible, not just to artists, but to capture the imagination and guide, guide us into the future? Because I think that was one of the reasons for the Layers exhibition, is to create that connection. So, so how do you feel the present? I, I, I think it's wonderful. I think uh, we should do this more often uh, everywhere. And at the same time, we kind of do something like this. When we, when we do workshops, for example, at schools, working and with children, <clears throat> talking about rock art and making them uh, get inspiration from rock art and make them draw or paint um it's it's fascinating how how children can do this in a more spontaneous way than we adults and uh i think that's one thing that we should uh reinforce um i don't know in other places but at least in argentina uh, it's education about the past mm. i think um it's it's a, a very, a very rich way to 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 understand other ways of living, uh, and to respect other ways of living and other other ways of um, telling a story. Uh, and uh, Marcela talked about um, this interaction between people, and I'd like to to point out that the interaction is not only with materials, it's also with ideas. Mm -hmm. And that is what is happening here. That is what technology enables us to do, to, uh, to exchange ideas uh, with people from all over the world. We are thousands of kilometers away from you, but we are exchanging ideas. And that's, and that's what happened in other ways in the past. So it's just, we are doing just the same, but with technology, we interaction and, and trying to, to communicate with others, uh, I think it's the most important thing in, in order to, to achieve uh, respect and peace. I think it's one way of doing it. And art is a, it's a wonderful way of doing it. And, and I guess also, um, Sven, if I remember correctly, you did position the exhibition also in the context of a time of crisis and going back to origins, shared origins, and prior to language. And I think that's also important for rock art to show away. And you can see it in the like-mindedness of the scientists. Mm. Yeah. So thank you very much, Maria Pia and Marcella, for indulging an artist with <laughs> my limited knowledge of your field of expertise. But um, it's been a pleasure. And thanks to you, too. Um, yeah, if, the, if there aren't any uh, questions f uh, from the audience, we'll take a, a brief break. Um, for those that have joined us online, thanks very much. We'll be back in sort of uh, 10 minutes or so. Uh, yeah, OK.
have worked for many years studying rocks art in the northern part of Mexico and the southwestern United States. Recently, I started studying rock art in the central eastern Mexican state of Puebla. I have found that some of the paintings in Puebla are similar to those in the northern areas mentioned, which suggests that there was cultural interaction between the people in those areas, specifically in the form of shared iconography. I moved to Puebla nine years ago, after working in Sinaloa and Chihuahua for 25 years. It was difficult to let go of the stereotype of the Shishi Mica, knowing that the Mesoamerican culture is predominant in Puebla and other parts of Mexico, due to an ethnocentric perspective. Rock art is often overlooked in favor of other aspects of Mexican culture, both among the general public and within the field of archaeology, but it is nonetheless an important part of the country's history. Human migration is a process of carrying cultural traits and ideas from one place to another. This can be done through diffusion, or by more direct means such as drawing or photography. Human migration is a physical movement of displacement, but it's also an act of carrying valuable languages and ideas without any extra weight. Diffusionism generates an imaginary parallelism between distant spaces. When you hear a word, you usually think of an image to go along with it. For example, if you hear the word hand, you might think of the image of a hand. But when you see a hand drawn or photographed, it becomes a more permanent image. In the same way, ancient people would take pigment and make an imprint on a rock to eternalize a hand image. Drawing or photographing a natural form such as a hand gives it a permanent place in the universe. With the experience and information that I have obtained during more than 30 years of researching rock art in various regions of Mexico and the southwest of the United States of America, I have discovered that this material culture is diverse both in time, culturally, and in spaces or regions studied that contain it, but in addition to the fact that it is not uniform, it responds to diverse cosmovisions that are expressed in the cult of the cloud, the rain, the rainbow, to water, land and corn, agriculture, and not only this, it also reflects trends or influences such as, for example, the butterfly hairstyle of the marriageable women of the Hopi group of the southwestern United States of America that is also present in the spaces or Mexican regions of Chihuahua and Puebla. The first of those regions in northern Mexico is northern Sinaloa. In it I recorded, at the site of San Vicente, the figure called Tlala Cornada Magoyan, which is actually a white cave painting with a trapezoidal head, large eyes, and a body with internal staggered designs known as a blanket design. This Tlaloc, which is not exactly the same as the one in Mesoamerica, is a spiritual entity related to water, rain, and clouds. For the second region, that of Chihuahua, another Tlala Cornada Magoyan is presented in Petrogravure at the Samalayuca site, and in painting at the Park Lodo site, for the third region, which is the southwestern United States of America, the same specific form is shown at the Hueco Tank site in Texas and the Three Rivers site in New Mexico. A great discovery in recent years has been this same figure for the fourth region, which is Puebla, and it is particularly the Cueva de los Muncos in the Sierra Norte of Puebla and the Tejalpa site in the south of the state, both with that sort of spiritual entities expressed in the cultural area of Mesoamerica. In our case study, this question has already been answered with the example of the Tlala Cornada Magoyan. But this is also reinforced by the presence of the intermediaries between human beings and the gods, the makers of rain clouds that are the Kachinas of the Pueblo Indians, Hopi and Zuni, and that are represented in rock art in Texas, United States of America, specifically on the Hueco Tank site. Similarly, there are Kachinas in Puebla, Mexico, at the Altar de Caraaco site located in the Sierra Norte of Puebla. And in that same sense, there are other examples in the region studied with the representations of the Huishal crosses or eyes of God both in Sinaloa, Chihuahua, and Puebla, in addition to the horned snake with and without a corn collar and the specific forms of the grains of this plant in Sinaloa, Vialacawai, Chihuahua, Arroyo de los Manos, Texas, Fort Hancock, in Casas Grandes ceramics from the middle period in Chihuahua, 1060 to 1350 AD, in Puebla, the Cueva de Lencho Diego and Tejalpa and the specific figure known as the rain altar, it is presented in the form of a hat, with bird wings, with and without raindrops. The figures of the corn plant, that of the bird perched on this plant and the mancorn, are specific forms that are represented in three rivers, New Mexico and Altar de Caraaco, Puebla, 
graphic elements also related to water, earth, rain, clouds, and corn. Vital aspects for the development of the agricultural peoples of Mexico and the southwest of the United States with their own activities that intensified from the year 1000 AD. Today, studying rock art is very relevant because not only do we come from it, but because it has saved us by bringing us to this precise moment and recreates us on the planet as an intelligent species. The four regions that I have studied, present a series of very important examples of what has been said, the first is the association between anthropomorphs and zoomorphs with three fingers or phalanges and rectilinear or quadrangular figures, such as the sites of Durango, Mexico, Cueva Pinta, border with Chihuahua, Sinaloa, Cerro El Cochi, and Puebla, Tejalpa. This association is possibly the expression of a code that is integrated into the Yutnahua or Yaddo Aztecan linguistic trunk. The last element is the representation of Hopi women from the southwestern United States with butterfly or side bun hairstyles, and its influence or fashion for this form of hairstyle is clear because it appears both at the Rincon de los Apache site in Chihuahua and in San Pablo Amal Tepec in Puebla, both in Mexico. The latest discoveries made by our research in the south of Puebla, in the Tejalpa site and in the Sierra Norte of Puebla, are rather surprising, since the representation of the cactus called peyote, Lophophora williamsi, has been verified both in painting and in engraving on rocky surfaces from sites such as Cueva de los Muncos and Monticelli Huitamilco, the latter with a peyote represented with one of its segments bitten off. Peyote contains mescaline, a psychotropic substance that has been traditionally used since ancient times in religious and healing ceremonies by indigenous groups in the southwestern United States and western and northern Mexico. In Chihuahua, for example, there are two very important sites with cave paintings of peyotes represented in profile and in plan, this is the case of Cueva de las Monas and Canada El Café, with one of its peyotes bitten as well. This cultural manifestation refers to the non-existence of borders in the past, to human migration and to the commercial exchange of ideas and worldviews between the peoples that existed before the arrival of the Europeans in this northern part of the American continent. In rock art, there are specific figures that are the same as those that exist in many parts of the world, examples of which are spirals, concentric circles, straight lines, human faces and hands, complete schematic anthropomorphs, zoomorphs and phytomorphs, as well as luminaries such as the sun, the moon, the stars, and the comets. However, in each space, time, and culture, these acquire diverse and different meanings because each of the contexts gives them a different meaning. Finally, the study of rock art in our times has become more important. It is a mirror through which we see ourselves reflected, so it is vital to preserve it, study it and recreate it artistically for the good of ourselves and future generations. Go.
No, I can only see one other image, and that is, I don't know if it's Richard, because I don't know Richard. Oh, this is Richard, yes. I'm Richard. Uh, Hello. Hi, Richard. And behind <laughs> us is the um, exponential uh, peyote screen. Yeah, we have a peyote screen. <laughs> Very impressive. <laughs> Rock art from Mexico. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> So we were just, yeah, the previous film um, that like the Frances uh, Francesco Mendiola Galvan showed us was referring to peyote in, in some of the um, ancient rock art. Um, Angela, so I'm just going to start by sort of introducing everyone very briefly and the topic of discussion uh, when we get there. Um, and. I've, I've put a couple images of media facts uh, and from the, to contextualize it straight to the point as well in a folder. So if there's anything you want me to pull up, uh, just say so. Um, similarly, Mila, I've got screenshots from the film that you sent through. Is, is Mila with us? Uh, not yet, okay. I'm gonna do that so we can also see Angela. Tell me, Sven, just did you did you have any? I mean, was there a structure you had in mind? Like, do you want me to do a little presentation, or are we just going to chat, or what? What did what did you have in mind? I think quite quite informal, not a not a particular structure. We'll introduce the discussion. Um, I think, yeah, take it from there. I'm <laughs> yeah, okay. I, I don't think there's a particular order. If there's particular things that you want to show, that said, if. Um, you know, I've got all the images. Well, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, I d yeah, I've got some stuff at hand if need be, but I also didn't prepare anything concrete. So we'll, we'll just go. That's all good. Um, Thank you. Look at where it takes us. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to get a glass of water because I've just been talking for an hour and a half. Hold on. Sure. Okay, admit. Okay. No image. Hi, Mila. That's cool. Yes, still no image. I'm sorry. I must do something here. See if uh, I can okay. get. Oh, um. it's okay. Okay. Wonder if I can do something here. My video is on, but. Uh, yeah. Yeah. We're going to see if we can do something on our end for your video. Okay, nothing. Nothing can be done. Yeah, that's, that's yeah well, uh, let me try. Unfortunately, you, you can start and I, maybe I'll join whenever I can. Uh, I mean, it's okay. If we go without an image, I'm sure, it's, I'm sure we'll be fine. <laughs> yes, okay. Well, be nice. Anything, sure. Yes, I'm not showing anything I'm talking, so it will be okay. Uh -huh. Will be anyhow my the book bookshelf behind me. So, <laughs> um, okay. okay, I think we can. Yeah, we're good. All right. Um, so, welcome back, everyone. Um, the the talk we're about to begin is titled "The Organizing Principle." Uh, I'd like to thank Angela Ferreira for joining us from Lisbon, Portugal, as um, as well as uh, Mila Samoas de Abru, um, who's joining us, I believe, uh, from where are you, Mila? Portugal. I'm in I'm in Portugal too, in Vila Real. <laughs> okay, and uh, Richard, who's who's live with me here in person. Um, the the sort of framework for this discussion, and it's it's a loose framework, but in general, it's to talk about um, the understanding of rock art as one of the earliest forms of the written word, um, which enables information to be preserved and for people across uh, space and time, essentially to code, embed information in a particular medium and transmit that or distribute it. Um, so it explores the role of rock art as a precursor um, or as a kind of organizing principle and something that we can consider as a forerunner to say the modern nation state or something that at least enables people to organize en masse like that and to pass information along uh, from one generation to the next. 
Uh, and thinking about, yeah, uh, I've said that already. So, yeah, in short, I mean, all of um, uh, both, both um, Richard and Angela uh, have included works in the exhibition that's at Nirox. Um, Media Facts uh, 3 was the name of Angela's work, and Reverence 1, 2, and 3 were the works that Richard produced. Um, and they're wildly disparate, but what they do have in common for me is this idea of transfer, of deconstruction, of uh, reassembling something in a particular way. And I was quite interested in how, in some areas, they, they they touch on that transfer or that process of something extending beyond a particular moment in time, pushed by different urgencies, different particular historical contexts. Um, and uh, Mila, I was also really captivated in your video by the various uses of technology. Um, you know, these kind of uh, 3D scans and prints and drones that were being used to re-render rock art and translate it into a different form. Um, so I guess to start, Richard, maybe you want to want to take us off about the sort of context in which you produced Reverence. And one of the things for me, again, from that Cherubiquette film that we watched earlier, uh, was this idea of rever Reverence, which is the title. You know, there is, he talks about the trepida trepidation of going into Cherubiquette, okay. the various dangers, the, the process itself, as, as well as the awe when confronted by um, the works that they found. I'm going to pull up an image so you can talk through it, but yeah. Sure. Go for it. Oh. Let's uh, see. Any one of those? That one. Oh, oh. That's a good one, yes. That one. Very beautiful. Is this microphone on? Yeah. <coughs> yep. Good. Um, so uh, this, in this work, it, it demonstrates something that often interests me. And, and I think you, you referred to um, how we might enter nature as well and how we leave marks, um, intended or unintended. So in, in this body, in these three works, they, there's almost an unintentional idea that, that the, the natural elements will meet each other and start to communicate with each other. Um, and I know that in my, inside my human body, I, I feel this overwhelming need to control that and prevent it and protect the one from the other and stop things like rust um, because that means something's perishing. Uh, and control is built into the makeup of, of what you mentioned about modern day society and how we're bringing rock art into contemporary times. I'm observing that the passing of things is very healthy and allowing the, 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 the erosion, allowing the, the artwork to demonstrate that passing. Um, there's, a, there's something of a relief in that for me. Um, because there's a lot of pressure in making something immortal and timeless. And I found it veritably impossible. So I have given over to it. And the work can do what it needs to do. It can go on its journey. And per perhaps in, in, in a century that bowl will have rusted away and there'll be nothing left of it, and the stone will be colored reddish brown, and it will be deeply embedded in there. Somebody will cherish it then in a new way. The stone will actually be there much, much longer than all the other elements. Uh, though the, the two other elements will have had a, a, a memorable journey with the stone, the stone will be holding the, the memory. Uh, and that's what really uh, I find really interesting. I find that beautiful and poetic. I mean, there's, there's also a sense in these works for me, um, if you pull perhaps a different view of them, you know, where some of them are shaped like 
Uh, for example, the one on the left there, I mean, I know that there are direct references to bees and to the bee sting um, and uh, the ways in which we've learned from nature in those particular ways. Um, but it's a, what, yeah, there's a different approach to f um, form or shape or understanding the material and how it transfers from one to other, right? The process of rust accumulating through the water and touching the base of that meniscus against the, the mm. rock and then having that information mm. transfer. Mm. It, it's, there's a waiting game as well as a... There is. Um, but, but in terms of what it's referring to, I'm not necessarily exactly choosing the bee sting, mm. but there are elements showing up around me as I work. Or the tool. Right, or the tool I'm working with, and, and I am... I'm enjoying the tools, I'm enjoying the stone, I'm enjoying all the, all the aspects, I'm reveling in that. And then the, the martial eagle flies over my head. And I, I don't choose to directly reference that martial eagle, but something transfers as I do that. Um, and so those elements are, are allowing me, I, I heard in an earlier part there was an element of control. I personally like the idea that I get my brain away from my hands and allow the years of training to just permeate through my hands and trust that that's going to be something of, uh, or, or and also trust that I'm going to let go and maybe it won't be anything. Um, oh yeah. the, uh, to pull up another image this time of uh, Angela Ferreira's work, um, Media Facts 3, I'm going to go or refer to um, the the original uh, version that was produced uh, in two thousand and eleven, I believe. Um, the work is here, and again, we're referring to a kind of a, a tool, essentially, uh, the fax machine. Um, Angela, I was wondering if you could walk us through its deconstruction and the context that informed this particular body of work. Yeah, I, I've not seen the image on my screen. I don't know if uh, this. It hasn't been pulled up yet, though. It's <coughs> it's there, um, but I don't know if... Do I need to bring it back to the screen? The image I have at the moment is Richard's work that, that you two have just spoken about. But I can... Uh, two seconds, sorry. Talk without an image, if need be. Okay. Uh, I think start, start in the meantime while we find the image and then we'll, we'll pick it up. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was just, you know, as you, as you made the introduction, hello everybody and thank you Sven for inviting me to this um, forum here today. Um, yeah, I was, I was listening to you talking right at the beginning and, and I was thinking how, um, <clears throat> sort of by way of introduction, maybe I should just say that, um, you know, the idea of communication in a broader way and then in more specific ways has is, is sort of been in my work now for, yeah, there we go, for quite a few years. Um, and um, this thing, this idea that you communicate with people over time and space um, is, is, is one that these works have enabled me to think about somehow. And that's why I wanted to start off by thinking a little bit broadly about communication. In fact, um, this particular work that, that we're looking at, which is part of a project called Carlos Cardoso Diretto, so straight to the point, um, I, I, was, I was invited into a, a conference a few years ago, quite a few years ago, um, that that the theme of the conference was actually interactives for Africa. And I remember thinking, why am I being invited onto this conference? Um, what do I know about interactives? And I certainly don't work with computers. And so I was, I was but you know, I had to find my way around that. And I had to sort of deep, dig deep into my practice. And eventually I realized that some of these recent works since 2010 have been about deeply about 
communication and different forms of communication. And I, I understood that a lot of the people that were behind the projects that I'm working on uh, were, were human beings that were um, very inventive in terms of uh, communication. And that, that inventiveness could be interesting um, to share um, with people who are interested in interactives in Africa because they were all Africans as well and they had had a very particular creative approach to what they were doing. So I'm, and just before I start Sven on this particular work, I'd also like to say that when you invited me to be part of this exhibition, I really had the same, exactly the same response was, well, where do I fit into this, into this, you know, I don't, I'm not working specifically with rock art and I've not given rock art that much thought other than, you know, as a curious tourist going to visit spaces that are beautiful and have um, rock paintings and there's one particularly amazing one here in Portugal called Foscoa. Um, but I, I kind of allowed myself to, once again, I allowed myself to listen to you and when you started talking about, you know, rock art being a way of communicating and how it enables communication to last through time and space, it again made sense to me, the idea of these projects and that's how I suppose we found each other in en route to this exhibition. So. Going to this project now, more specifically, I should just say that um, the whole project is, is about a man called Carlos Cardozo, who was a Mozambican uh, journalist. And he was um, probably at one time considered, in the, in, the, in the 90s, he was probably considered one of the best informed journalists on Southern Africa, on the geopolitics of Southern Africa. He was. Um, very astute, um, traveled a lot, um, very uh, knowledgeable and very interested in knowledge. And he understood the complexities of what was going on in South Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola, Namibia, uh, Botswana. Um, he, he was very um, fluid in his approach to the way um, events had repercussions on, um, on on the different countries simultaneously, on how one event, for example, would have repercussions on different countries. And, and we all know that, you know, events did have connections. I mean, we all know that the South African um, apartheid state, for example, financed Renamo, which was the sort of contra movement uh, against Frelimo and so on. Anyway, Carlos Cardozo was, um, was also persecuted in Mozambique and was finally assassinated because he was um, doing fairly innovative at the time in the early 2000s when he was assassinated. He was doing fairly innovative, harsh investigation on the World Bank and the Mozambican Bank uh, around issues of corruption. And um, my project is very much a homage to him but when I researched about uh, Carlos Cardozo, I found a guy that was not only a news person and, and brilliant at, at his job, but actually a genius in terms of communication. So in the, early, in the late 80s, when he, was, he himself was persecuted by the Frelimo government and put in jail, and when he came out of jail, he was unable to work in a newsroom. In, in, in Mozambique, he, um, he invented something which was called Mediafax, which was in fact a fax newspaper. He realized that, um, that if you had a phone number and you had a fax machine, you could write, report on news and write them at night and you could transmit them in the morning. And if you had a hundred phone numbers of people all over the world, you could be transmitting a newspaper, a global newspaper, um, from your Maputo home um, via your fax. And 
And also there's a beautiful story about how um, there's only one fax machine in Maputo in the 80s and it is brought in by a famous Swedish writer called Mankell and the two of them were friends and it was with Mankell's fax machine that he um, invents this, this, this newspaper called Media Fax. So for example, um, he, he's the first Mozambican to report on the Renamo Accords, the, the truce and peace accords that was signed in Rome. Um, but what was interesting to me was how he had actually found a way around the difficulties that were imposed on him. And he managed to, through technology, um, continue his drive for communicating with people in the world. So when I did my project, I actually did my project 10 years after he died because I saw uh, an article um, in the newspaper written by Judy Fredrickson um, paying homage to him. And at that point, um, being a Mozambican myself, I thought, well, this man needs to be um, paid respects to. So I, I decided to do a project on him. And my first intuition was like reverse engineering of Carlos Cardozo. So I had a fax machine in my cupboard which we weren't using anymore because by 2010, nobody used fax machines. So I was privileged to be able to literally take my fax machine apart. And so the sculptures that, that I made for this project, and I think there were, there, were, there were more of them, but about the fax machine, there were five different sculptures that were um, based on the mechanics of how a fax machine works. And of course, part of the mechanics of the fax machine is how this is not my work anymore now. Um, so part of the mechanics of the fax machine was very much the way the paper has to enter it, it has to exit it, um, and the way that on the paper is registered um, uh, words. Um, so the natural uh, uh, intuition was, well, then I will just print on, I will make a sculptural object that somehow includes um, a rendition of the idea of the paper that goes through the rollers and, and print on the wood the text from the actual fax machines. So mm -hmm. the media fax newspaper, sorry. So that's how this project um, came to be. And uh, um, so, yeah, in a way, what, what, what I'm really happy about here, Sven, is how you've kind of reminded me that um, I've, I've put into print that which Karsh Cardozo didn't put into print, but which he would have wished to put into print in a sculptural form. And um, yeah, and you've kind of found a way <laughs> to this project and to continue paying homage to him. And so, yeah, it's about communication and it's about writing on sculptures in this, in this particular instance. I mean, what, what also interested me is the, you know, I know the, as forms, the sculptures are, you know, they look relatively simple, but I know through Daniel Gray, who very kindly fabricated your work, that it was incredibly difficult to produce that work, right? So when you speak of Kadosho's inventiveness, um, that's echoed in some sense in the fabrication or the development of these works. And I mean, Milar, I also wanted to um, bring you into the conversation here to talk about, I know that you've done a lot of research throughout um, different parts of, of Europe, South Africa too, um, around rock art. Um, now I was blown away by Genevieve von Potzinger's observation that over a sort of 30,000 year period, there were 32 symbols found throughout the whole of Europe. Um, and so thinking about these things as precursors to the written word or, or to language. Again, I mean, Angela used the term to find a way around. And those obstacles that people were facing was what you arrive, I'm just sort of hypothetically, you arrive in a new place, you don't know anything about it. There are inscriptions on a rock surface that you can find that might 
give you information. I've I've no idea if that was the practical use of of rock art during those times. But I'm interested to to hear more from you, Mila, about what you've um, about your research and and how how you kind of viewed the organizing principle of rock art in general. Okay, so I I connect another computer to have. Uh, uh, if you give me permission, I have another computer that is asking to. Oh, is that you? Zoom. Yeah. Elan. It will give you my the image, but it, it's not so important anyhow. <laughs> okay, so let me tell you that it's, it's a really a pleasure to be um, talking to all of you around the world. I know that there's quite a lot of people that are, are uh, seeing us in uh, YouTube. Um, I, I think in particularly the Instituto Italiano di Cultura, that's the reason why I'm here. I'm representing, in fact, in fact the Centro Camuno. Studi Prehistorici, that is in Valcamonica in Italy, even if now I'm here in my university in, in, in Portugal. And it, yeah, what, what you said is it's, it's, quite, it's, it's quite interesting. You know, one, one of the most, um, I think, uh, um, problems that we have with that is that when we talk about rock car, most of people think of a particular chronological area, but in fact, rock car spans at least uh, 40,000 years. So it's not, not exactly the same thing as you can imagine if we talk about the Paleolithic rock art or um, the Stone Age uh, rock art or the m m very recent or more recent, shall we say, rock art that we found, for example, in Valcamonica in Italy, that is uh, uh, from m most of it is much later and quite a lot from the uh, last millennium before Christ. So 3,000 years ago. So obviously this means that uh, whatever signs um, can be produced uh, in a, such a, a long period of time, it, it, it probably they could have different meanings, of, of course. But they, there is no doubt that some meanings, and our colleague from Mexico was referring to some of them. For, for example, the, 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 the handprints, the negative or the handprints, are known uh, all around all around the world, and this this is for us as an archaeologist. I'm an archaeologist, so I study cultural material. I don't study it from the artistic point of view or the aesthetic point of view. I, I study it from as a as an object, a painted or engraved object, and <clears throat> this can be uh, very puzzling in a, in a sense because obviously uh, why uh, around the world some symbols are present if there is no contact you know it can be easily explained if you're talking to an, a geographical area where things uh, you know there, there's contact among people that are there but that's not the case the, the case is that sometimes we have the same symbol the spiral for example or, or other uh, other ones that are present in all continents and, and, and so why, why uh, we have that? And this is across only time and cultures and continents. So it's something that we need to relate, to, obviously, with us, the homo, homo sapiens, at least the homo sapiens. Sven, can you, can you listen to me now? Yes, we can hear you. OK, so because I, I see that you are looking to my name, so I thought that you were not listening. <laughs> Anyhow, so. Before, I, I found extremely interesting this uh, that you, we, you made us archaeologists have the pleasure to, to see some of these uh, um, objects of art that more than artists um, um, are doing today. Uh, why? Because often, you know, because we are archaeologists, we see it in this historical, shall we say, anthropological perspective and not as, as uh, art. And, and, and in fact, uh, um, you know, they, they, they are art besides being for us something that is related with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with archaeology, you know, with living, living um, people. No? And uh, the, the, the fact is that uh, um, around the world we have some image that are common to everybody. Sorry, my, my, okay, my image is back now. It's it's something that I, I I found extremely interesting as you as you can imagine. How can I how can I explain this? Well, I can explain because we we are all, uh, in a certain sense, biological similar, and so 
probably we have the same kind of perception of what is around uh, around us. Um, we know that, for example, some things can be obvious, like the footprints or the handprints. You know, it's something that comes from our body and that we it, it, it can express uh, something that is uh, uh, visually recognizable with what we are as as a person. But you know, the spiral or the dots, for example. And, and that's where, for example, the research made in rock art in uh, South Africa uh, really opened the mind of most of the archaeologists around the world and, uh, and, and made us think in a completely different way. There is, there is, there is a, um, a difference, obviously, when you talk about the rock art of South Africa or you talk the cave, the cave art. Um, sometimes there is a chronological difference of thousands of years, no? but you know behind this, there's, there's always us, and, and so that's what's uh, very important. You, you, you told us in in the beginning when we start this um, this talk, um, <clears throat> this group that you were impressed about the, the the techniques or some of the techniques that we use today, like drones and 3D. In fact, for most of us, it's quite frustrating, you know, because uh, rock art is something that is three-dimensional and it's very difficult to transform something that is three-dimensional in two dimensions, it means in, in photographs, in books, or uh, something that we can show to each other. And, and uh, th this fact, for sure, is one of the things that technology is, we are trying to use technology to um, uh, give a, 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 a more clear dimension of what we see. We, but in most cases, we are still far away. And that's why there's nothing, I think, better than to see, see the real rock art. I, I, I had the pleasure of being with quite a lot of number of artists and seeing rock art with them around, around the world. And um, uh, well, the, the, there's nothing like to see the real thing. There's, there is no doubt. And uh, and um, so t for some of the artists, you know, the, the, I know that there's several here, um, listen and seeing. You know, it, it is it is a, 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 um, uh, an experience that I will tell you that you should you should do you should go and see the real the real stuff because it's uh, um, it, it's completely different. I often say that um, you know the, there's a, a, a kind of quite a different of a tourist that go and see a, a site, and for example, an artist or even an archaeologist, and this is related related with something that was that somebody to, told us also today that is the, the environment where these things are, and uh, quite often you can see that tourists take pictures of the rock art and. The other take picture of the environment that is around them. There is a, a very strong relationship between the image made by, you know, our ancestors and the environment, and and this is something that um, we we should always have uh, have uh, in mind. Um, it is difficult for us to sometimes visualize that because the. In, in, in lots of cases, the landscape transformed. It's not the same. And there are, there are places where there were no trees, and now there are trees, or the opposite. And so um, part of the experience that was performed, shall I say, by our ancestors, it's very difficult for us to follow. And if I may say, and I think this can um, be interesting also for all of you. There is an element that we will never recuperate. That is the sound, and some of these things have, uh, have um, um, I think, a, not a connection to, to the sound. And that's why, for example, we've been noticed in the last decade. Studies have been made that rock art usually is in places that, from the acoustic point of view, are very interesting. And where, for example, there is the echo, or or where your voice, or whatever sound is, is as a different, um, different uh, um, uh, shows a completely different thing than silence. Mm -hmm. So I, I, would, I would say that rock art has, if I may say, to conclude, three elements that are very important for me. One is that is if there is something that unites us, is really art, and uh, rock art is the beginning of that. You know that oh, uh, it, it has nothing to do with the, 
what culture we are, or, or what color we are, or whatever. And um, the, the other important thing is that no doubt, no doubt is a window for the past. I'm not so sure that if it's a, the beginning of writing, I think it's more a bit more profound than even that, always behind it. Um, um, but um, and and then and then finally is because it gives us uh, this strong relationship between us as Homo sapiens and our and our surroundings, the the landscape where we where we move. Mm -hmm. So these three very important, I think, uh, reasons. I, I wish we could have m more um, uh, times to sometimes to have artists with us. I must tell you that IFRAO, the International Federation of Rock Art Association that I belong to, uh, we we were pioneers and for the first time introducing um, in 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 our congress a, sec a section on statics and rock art. Archaeologists usually don't like that to talk about that. You know, don't like to talk about feelings and and also statics and and um, I think this is a a, a, a way that we should. Um, to to follow and to have more of this kind of uh, interactions between uh, uh, present day artists and and the artists of uh, um, the future. In in fact, to, today um, and to really to conclude, I, I sometimes think maybe maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not a, I'm not really an archaeologist, but maybe I'm more an uh, art historian or something or you know, something like that. Or Maybe in the end, I'm a bit of a frustrated artist also. So. <laughs> uh, Richard, I see you've made a bunch of notes. I don't know if you wanted to chip in at this point. Yeah, I, I'm curious because I'm not actually coming from that place of all. Uh, uh, Mila has amazing knowledge and experience. <coughs> um, even though I've spent time in the cradle, it's more of a, uh, as you say, um, it's more of a feeling and a sensation that occurs that being in that place um, that brings up uh, from, from the soil, it brings up the, the, um, the energy and the passion to make the work. There's something extraordinary about being in the cradle of humankind that makes that happen mm -hmm. or being in landscape that makes that happen. Um, but I'm curious about rock art in the three dimensions. You mentioned three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. And to me, um, I, uh, my oldest reference would be uh, um, a Venus figure carried for, for fertility mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a totem. But uh, uh, and are you referring to the, the three dimensions being the cave or the mountain? Well, the, the three dimensions are there in several ways. The, the surface, shall we say, you know, where these things were made. You know, most of, most of the art that is made, for example, in caves, the cave itself, the surface of the case, can be important. But in open air also, in rock shelters, you know, the shape of the cave, shape of the rock shelter is, if you look to, to the same figure in different ways, you will see you're moving even. And I think this is something that, for example, um, we are still far away to understanding, but the the some the person that made it took into consideration sometimes, and and I, I work in Lesotho in in the Drakensberg, and where is this is very obvious, you know, if you look to the rock shelter from one side or to the other, the image are are moving, and even with the, with the engravings. The engravings are themselves, you know, the difference between painting and engravings is that in, in the paintings you you overlap the the pigment to the surface in the engravings you remove one so in two, we can say that one is adding something to the surface and the other one is removing to the surface and and in in all these cases you know the being the three dimensional is is there of course then in the figurines and the, in the objects that's even more relevant but it, it exists you know um Sometimes the, 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 the ones that made the, this art choose particularly uh, fixtures on the rocks, some cracks, for example, the cracks can be the, the, the way from where they start to, 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 to draw and to make the, the, um, the figure. Sometimes the, uh, the, 
the, the surface is choose to show, for example, the belly of the animal. So no doubt they had extremely, um, they are sens their sensibility in relation to, the, to this three dimensional is all the time there. And when we do a picture, you know, it's not exactly the same. And well, this I can you can say this to any sculpture, but uh, or, or any other thing like that. But um, today, the, the rock art researchers are more and more aware of, of this that there is other other components that you know it's not only color, it's not only the the, the figure itself, but there's things that we should take in consideration, like where it is the landscape, and now and now, so as I said, the sound. Sound is a fantastic thing. Most of these places, uh, you, you can talk normally and you can, you know, your voice goes. So can you imagine that with the sound of music or the sound of other, or any, uh, even natural features like the water running and things like that. So it's a highly, it's not only graphic, but is really an emotional experience for them, for sure. In some cases, we know that they used to even drum the rock. There is, there's quite a lot of evidence, this, for example, in some of the caves, but also in open air in Brazil, for example, this happens quite often. So this, the, the rocks also produce sounds. So there's all these elements that are very important. And you know, you can find this in art, of course, too. Um, it's bringing to mind Ayers Rock in Australia, which is a sacred place which uh, um, became a tourist site for a long time. People mm. would go and walk up to the top of it because they felt mm -hmm. that they could. But the Aboriginal people have managed to bring in a, a law that prevents people from walking over it because they consider it a sacred place. So if you see it on the landscape, it has, it's, it's somewhat like the, a pregnant belly on the flat land. Um, that changes in the different light, and um, so uh, 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 fantastic uh, sight. Yeah, an, an incredible well, sight. Yeah. Yes, I was the pleasure to. I, I don't know if most of you know one thing that is very funny. I, I was there, and uh, I of course didn't climb the the the, the, the Uluru. I wouldn't do it, but I went around. I went around, and you know, there's a part that cannot be photographed, and so most of the photographs that you see there are from one side only. So there's an obscure, a dark side of the moon, shall we say, in the in the rock, and that's very very interesting too, I think. Uh, and then the reason is because the Aboriginals think that if something happened to you when you're climbing, and it's it's not an easy climb, this will fell on all of them and so mm. fortunately you, you know but when i was there there were still people climbing yes it's true so so you're also bringing up another interesting topic or or, or branch of of this theme which is um the land and the consideration of the land and how say first peoples treated the land as 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 a place they respected. So often these these cave these caves are, are secret or sacred places, and mm -hmm. the the ego is not so huge that they've carved the mountain to look like themselves. Um, th there's a there's a deeper consideration of going to a, a, a special place, but just the human is imbalanced to the nature. I mean, it's. No. This is actually one of the, Angela, I know when, when we first started speaking about potential works that you could have on exhibition, the first one we we were discussing was a work around a quarry, around um, the exploitation of, of raw minerals and materials. And I know that Richard spent a lot of time in quarries. I know it's a, it's a driving concern for a lot of you, but for me what's interesting here is how one's environment essentially creates the kind of urgencies uh, depending on what we do, it's the same with um, you know, Carlos Codocio's need to get that information out there it was born of a particular place. The urgencies that you're speaking around uh, as rock in Australia, those um, and that process of trying to communicate this or how the method that you choose to bring that across. I mean, Mila, you said in your WhatsApp message so last week that you've just come back fighting over some mm. uh, potential. Well, yes, it's 
Unfortunately, you know, I, I spent quite today. I spent quite a lot of time as a, as an activist, shall I say, fighting to to save uh, rock art uh, places. And uh, we have one now that is um, to, to to give to give you three three one three examples of of, of sites that are are um, sorry yeah that are are. Um, in dangerous one 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 is in uh, there's a beautiful site that is um, very close um, to one, a major rock art site that is a world heritage site in in Piauí in the northeast of, of Brazil and mining is uh, horrible uh, it's a problem that we have a lot uh, around the, around the world and in Australia it's terrible it's all over you know <clears throat> usually unfortunately rock art sites are first in very beautiful places then places that have something else and so they uh, appeal to to the industry shall we say you know the dams for example in the rivers and things like that and and my uh, mining is a, a bit of problem the, the other site is um, a site here in in the mountains real near where I am in this moment and they are going to um, install uh, something that looks very nice and very ecological that's the wind farm you know to produce electricity with wind the problem is, is that they are they are uh, putting these towers just on top of the rock art the rock art shelters a hundred panels with the art that is a, a very rare in Europe in Europe we don't have very too much rock art painted in the open air so it's very rare and uh, and it's not very beautiful statically so people don't connect maybe in the, the same way and uh, and the and the last side shall let me tell you and in these days we talk about a lot that is in a war zone in in Ukraine you know unfortunately today wars are destroying quite a lot of rock arts so it's 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 us you know it's the nature sometimes but the main issue today on preservation of what has thousands of years sometimes is this is is us it almost happens the one that creates is the one that destroying some of these uh, these uh, sites and the one in ukraine we don't have a clue if still exists because the person that was there the responsibles uh, uh, took or were killed, and the other the other one ran away. So we, we don't. We, I cannot tell you if it still exists today. So um, in industry, you know, and um, sometimes it looks very good, like the wind the wind mills, uh, doing uh, doing farms, and then they 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 are responsible for destru the destruction of uh, quite a lot of uh, of rock art and. Um, in South Africa, um, there, 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 there were quite a lot of number of rock art sites that uh, were being they were destroyed in, in the last in the last years. It's not only South Africa, but you know, in, all, all over all, all, all over the world, it's a major problem. Um, so preservation sometimes today is a, a fight that, us as archaeologists, we cannot let. It, um, be only in the hands of the governments. Governments will not care about that. So it's all of us that we need to take. And um, if you if you know any site, maybe may I do a bit of publicity. If you know any site that is in danger, of of uh, please write to us as if Rao, because that's uh, that's that's what we do. We try to save rock art uh, sites around uh, around the world, and with them sometimes. You know, the local population is it's obviously very important for us. The, the best protection of rock art is the ones that know about them, so the traditional owners. And this is valid for the Amazon as it is from, uh, as in Australia or Indonesia or, uh, or, or um, around the world. There's millions of rock art sites, so it's complicated. It's not <laughs> an issue. And, you know, most of them they are not not known, um, famous like the caves in Europe, and uh, and, and so um, it's very interesting to um, to see the, the 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 group that was talking before uh, Mexico. I I can tell you that um, 30 years, almost almost 40 years ago, I, I when I was very young, I went to Mexico, and I remember to go to the to the National Institute of Archaeology Anthropology in in the city of Mexico, asking to go. We wanted to go to Baja California. That uh, we knew that there was some rock art there, 
And, and in Mexico City, they had no clue that they, what we were talking about. So uh, today, fortunately, is a World Heritage Site too, so Sierra de San Francisco in the Baja California. The World Heritage Sites that have a rock art, fortunately today, there are quite a lot in Africa. For a long time, it was Europe, and and you know they are all, all, all over all over the world, but they could be more. That's no doubt. It's they I guess like what you you're saying, Miller, especially around today in our current information age, there are a lot of kind of competing narratives all the time, and it is about different uh, means of communication. I'm thinking Angela now about Carlos Codocho's fight to get information into people's homes and where that urgency, you know fact that he was being censored externally and had to find uh, an alternate means to uh, get his, his, the story out there into people's homes. And that's where this kind of ingenuity and inventiveness of his practice came in. Um, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually, I'd, I'd like to um, um, pick up on something that Milo said. Um, which I find um, uh, it was kind of instructive for me at this at this moment as I was listening to to Mila, um, and it's the whole idea of um, <clears throat> how one 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 can't see rock art as simple an image a, a reproduced image you know and how um, one needs to consider the <clears throat> the whole environment and the whole um, setting. The whole material that the that the <clears throat> image is is left on or scraped on or added on, as you well put it, Milla, in very sculptural terms. Um, but I I think you know I mean I, I of course as a contemporary artist who doesn't worry too much about um, uh, how long my work's going to last. Um, I am very drawn to the idea that was kind of forwarded in the late 20th century um, and that argued for the validity of site-specific art. Um, and it occurred to me while I was listening to uh, Mila how, you know, the way you're describing um, sound and the three-dimensionality of the environment that uh, we lost Angela. We lost. What's the sound? The first sound. Um, and and how um, in many ways I was funny enough this morning as I was driving around, I was thinking um, of how we are able to um, transmit information through images so eff efficiently and even films and videos and sound I mean because these days you could actually make a film of a rock yeah. art painting and transmit the sound as well and you could recreate the environment pretty close to what the experience mm -hmm. of being there is and you know as an artist that is of course a challenge and a, 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 an interesting thing right. to think about and the one the one element that, I that you answer. sorry sorry yeah so the the one thing that 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 um the one element that is not easily transferable into artistic means to my knowledge or very efficiently is, is smell um mm. uh, so that's um sorry my dog <laughs> Smell. <laughs> um, and and you know I was kind of dwelling about that, so I was curious what what you said now about the self consciousness of the idea that rock art isn't just an image. It's it's a much more complex experience that has to do with the locale that you experience it in, and that mm -hmm. sort of led me to think of something else that that as I said, I'm not an artist that. Um, is very preoccupied with whether my work lasts one year or a hundred years or a thousand years. But the one thing that I do love very much is drawing. And so I've spent quite a lot of time thinking of why I like drawing. And I draw all the time. Drawing is very much a thinking process for me. It's a tool to think with. And um, I've often wondered why drawing is so important. I love looking at drawings of other people. and. 
the reason why I like to look at drawings of other people, and I think the reason why rock art is really important to one, more than the actual image or the act, you know, what is depicted in the, in the rock art, whether it's the animal or a human being or the hunt or what, what, whatever is depicted. What's more important to me as an artist is the fact that when I'm in the presence of that image on a rock, I know that another human being has been mm -hmm. there in the same mm -hmm. position. And that testament of the presence, of human presence, and it's a testament of human presence of utmost generosity. Unlike what you were saying, Sven, the holes that miners leave in our landscapes are a testament of human greed. Mm -hmm. You know, um, rock art is, in, is indeed the, the sort of primordial aesthetic experience, if you think of that, because it's, the, it's that the magic of it for me is to, is to actually feel the presence of my ancestors. When just as I feel the presence of an art, any art, artist, friend of mine or not friend of mine, when I I look at a Robert Rauschenberg drawing, I I it's amazing because the drawing is the immediate moment. It is where you can feel that the artist had the pencil in his hand and you could feel him tracing that line. And so yeah, so I was inspired by the way you you know, you describe the rock art experience as much, much more than simply the image that is depicted, which, of course, is the easiest thing to photograph and communicate with. But, um, you know, and, and you could go as far as thinking of why each site was chosen. OK, there's yeah. some that are symbolically very easy to decipher, but then there are other sites that are not so easy to decipher. But but would give, give you clues about behavioral needs and, and what Sven was talking about is how people were resourceful. Like, where do you make your mark? Where do you leave your mark? Is it in a visible spot or an invisible spot? Is it an obscure area? Uh, so is it a secret or is it a shout, you know, to other, uh, other people? Yeah, so I think the idea of us having the the memory of the markings that humans leave on this earth is is a very important thing. Uh, Zen, can I can I say only a very short thing? One of the most puzzling things in rock art is why our ancestors made figures on top of each other. No? Sometimes you have a panel, you know, have a surface, and everything is concentrated on top of each other. And why? Uh, you know, if, if it was only a message for the future or for others, why you do that? Why you put your stuff in, on top of whatever is there, sometimes with hundreds, sometimes even thousands of years before? And the reason is also because there is another element, you know, I can tell you, Angela, that is the action of doing it. That is also important. So we have another layer that is this one. You know, the, the fact that somebody made it, and when it was doing it, it was also, it was also very important. And so it, it, it is a bit more complicated, but at the same time, I think fascinating. I'm not a religious person at all, but I can tell you that every, every time that I see a rock art site and I'm going to a rock art site, I always think have this in incredible connection with w the person that made it. And this, I guess, religious, I don't know. <laughs> So um, <coughs> that's the, to me, that's the segue of, uh, to, toward what I find as an artist is, is really important, is whether you believe in some higher power or not, there's something that happens in the, in, in the need to make. There's something that happens in the process of making where time goes away and, and, and the need is immediate and this, uh, the, the inspiration is immediate and from what I've learned about the rock art here in South Africa there's a, there's a, a process that, that um, of breathing techniques to get to a certain state and certain people were given the role to be that in, in, in the community mm -hmm. um, and so there's a trance state they would get to 
um, in order to put those images in a place where the community or the, or, or, or the, the, the gathering could observe it, um, maybe to learn something about what's on, uh, here in Africa there's a, a lot of, um, there's a, a lot of the spiritual practices about the ancestors and uh, asking the ancestors for guidance and reaching into, into the ancestral space. And so <coughs> I find when I'm making, I'm attempting to go there myself more and more and more um, because there seems to be some deeper... Um, there's, a, there's something deeper in the work when I finish. Yeah, I mean the the corporeal aspect. You know, Angela referred to um, seeing Rauschenberg in the pencil mark and seeing the impress of that, or standing in Space, the, the uh, <laughs> shoes of, uh, or not standing in the shoes, but just in the knowledge that there was someone in that spot producing that artwork. I think you know, um, Rich and I have been having some discussions about the physicality of making sculpture and the way that it takes from the body in the process of carving. And if you want to, perhaps this is a good moment to sort of full circle back and then we can round up. Yeah, um, there's, uh, there's definitely some giveaway. So, so imagine sitting around the fire and, and beginning the breathing process to get in the state to, to <coughs> transfer the information onto a cave wall or a skin. Sometimes uh, I believe they also uh -huh. would use a skin to b if they weren't near a cave and the getting into this transcendental transcendental state um, a heightened state would and then coming out and putting the information down and at the end of that there's there's a little bit less of the person there they've they've, they've exuded a big piece of energy to be there and art has that aspect. It has this uh, uh, um, an agreement. <coughs> I, I consider it an agreement. I'm agreeing that in order to make this become something else, I'm prepared to give us a, a piece away. And I feel that when I'm looking at cave art. I, 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 the rock art tells me there was some transference and some sacrifice. And that 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 shows up for me. That's very personal. I'm not saying that that's happening for anybody else, but that's how I feel when I'm around it. And I'm blessed to live in a country where I can experience mm -hmm. it directly. So I often have to give away to go and find those caves. I have to go into the Bavians Kloof on a really hard road through very thorny environment just to find one rock under a, a, a sitting under a crevice and experience that that rock art and then the sun will move and I can't see it anymore <laughs> be, because it's so ethereal so mm -hmm. that that that's very true for me in this process and by the way I just before we're going to finish I need to let you both know that I started like the first marble I carved was in Alvid outside Lisbon and it, oh. uh, yeah, the first marble I ever carved was under a grapevine in Alvid, drinking uh, uh, cheap red wine. <laughs> and the stone came from uh, 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 Alcantara Mar. So, mm. yeah. It's a pleasure mm. to be oh. here with you, truly. Yeah, well, let me tell you, the first rock art I saw was on the Cedarburg. <laughs> <laughs> also climbing up mountains just like you and yeah so my first thoughts on all this stuff was way back then mm. yeah and I wanted to also share a detail a sort of fun detail that um, there's um, there's Portugal has a, a contemporary art collection so you know our museums collect art but now the government also has a contemporary art collection which is good we're all very happy that they're buying art but they opened, they, they opened this weekend, I think it was on Saturday evening, um, the first exhibition of the Portuguese 
public art collection, and the, they chose to do it at the Museu de Foscoa, which is, mm -hmm. I think, Mila, correct me, it's probably Portugal's better known rock art site, right? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's yeah. a World Heritage site, very important. And, it, and by the way, it was a fight that uh, uh, was the archaeology with the local people and others uh, against them, it was going to be built at. And the then Prime Minister, Antonio Guterres, decided to stop the dam and create a park. And he is today the General Secretary of the United Nations, so <laughs> it was a, a very good career, I guess. Yeah, but anyway, they so they chose that museum, yeah. which is a beautifully designed uh, mm -hmm. uh, museum, and they opened the exhibition on Saturday evening. And, um, and the exhibition is called Dark Safari. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I was kind of tickled by the, the sort of African illusion, but then I was, because when I saw safari, I thought, oh my gosh, now they're mm -hmm. calling this a safari, and then, and then they call it a dark safari. I thought, okay, there they could be a critical approach here to, is it to rock art, or is it to contemporary art, or is it to both? I wasn't quite sure, but I thought it would, was a nice moment to mention in our conversation today that contemporary uh, art uh, and Angela, rock I'm art come together. I, I was not there because I was giving a talk on the Sociedad Nacional de Belles Arts, so our National Society of Belles Arts. So you see, I, uh, there was a, there's a connection. I wasn't uh, there either. The, 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 muse, the Museum of Coa has two rooms dedicated to comp contemporary art with very good, with exhibitions from our, you know, most important artists passed through there. Mm. Yeah. Cool. Well, so, thank you. Um, maybe we should bring the exhibition. Why not? That's a fantastic <laughs> idea. I just said, why shouldn't you bring your exhibition here to the to COA? We can talk about that, no doubt. I think it would be very interesting. No, don't you think, Angela, that we could absolutely work, we could I totally work on that? So. I like yes, we could do work. I think, and I think Sven knows what to do to do I that. I think that's a great yes, idea. Yes, Let's do that. We can ask the, the <laughs> Instituto Camões and uh, others, you know, to help us, the Instituto Italiano di Cultura here in Lisbon. And I think they could help us bring the, the, your exhibition here to Foscoa, to the Museo of Coa. Hmm? <laughs> I would love that, yeah. Um, <laughs> we'll stay in touch. Hmm. Um, okay. All right, um, Mila, Richard, Angela, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I've really appreciated your time uh, sharing so openly of your knowledge and your work. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be in touch soon. It was great. Adeus. Was great. Thank you very much. Até a próxima. Até a próxima. Até a próxima, Richard. Nice to meet you and nice to meet you too, Mila. Bye. Are we off the live thing? Um, no, it's not. Oh, cool. Okay. Right. Well, we can play the we can play the next film now quickly, um, and then start the final conversation. You're right, but don't you? Can you not feel its presence? Okay. Well, this. I mean, uh, it's interesting. We had an uh, Italian as well, but this is from Carrara. So the sculptures you see in the collection, they are from what I call uh, wild stones.
My name is Romain Lahaye. I'm a rock art specialist and I have the chance to work for many years in Paleolithic caves. You've got many ways to study rock art. You can approach it by technical ways. My name is Romain Lahaye. I'm a rock art specialist and I have the chance to work for many years in Paleolithic caves. You've got many ways to study rock art. You can approach it by technical ways, by taking a lot of pictures, by studying it, by ethnographic analogies, by the phylogeny of myths, and all these studies provide valuable information on a particular facet of some rock art traditions. Because all these sites are particularly difficult to access, we have to crawl to bring heavy equipment. Our team tried to reproduce the caves in three dimensions so we can go back virtually whenever we want. I also have the chance to work on South African rock art, especially in the Drakensberg Park. But here as well, sites are really difficult to reach. Then I managed to go even a little bit further, trying to bring in my pocket the wall site, with all its iconographic details, all the volume and every crack on the rocky wall. For that, I take thousands and thousands of pictures. I put them in a software which recreate a giant 3D model. Then I can generate a huge and really accurate mosaic of all these pictures and study the paintings from my office in France.
uh, I know it's around biology and evolutionary studies and uh, yeah. I think pterodactyls when I think when I read you. <laughs> but he'll tell us dinosaurs. Birds and dinosaurs. Um, and yeah, so I mean, the, the topic of the conversations is cellular syntax, which was really thinking about how our understanding of the present um, shapes our engagement with the past, and by the same token, what it means to study the past through forms like rock art, uh, and how much of what we call knowledge is embodied or captured in a cellular syntax that invades being deciphered. Um, and in our present data-driven age, how embodied methodologies and a more sensory or haptic engagement with our surrounds might enable an integrated or res more respectful and symbiotic relationship with the natural environment. Um, so in other words, things encoded in the body, how say these uh, skeletons or fossils that we study are, have information embedded within them, how we as human beings interact with the world on a sensory level and absorb information from the world through our senses, you know, be it touch, sound, smell. Um, Carl, you had a, a wonderful, um, you, you said this wonderful thing in the, in the sort of interview that we had for the initial documentary that was produced about how, uh, as a kid, uh, you were asking me to imagine being a young boy um, and how that experience, you know, where you take things and you put them in your mouth and you leave your mark. I was hoping you could reflect on that a little bit um, before we, we get into your, your own practice and the work on show. Well, sure, you're asking me to reflect on my practice as a mother, perhaps. Sure. <laughs> yes. Um, I have three children who are all grown up now. But I think my observations of who they were as little ones, um, until you actually get to that point, you, you kind of don't think about that. And the fact that we actually want to leave marks as an extension of ourselves, perhaps initially not consciously, but it's something that's there. And um, I think I, I've always enjoyed that, considering how small human beings when they enter this world and how they want to find themselves and communicate through their senses. That's how we do it from the moment we are born. In fact, even before we are born, we are really communicating. We are really exploring, we're touching, we are absorbing, we're smelling. And I think it's no, no different uh, to when we are little and as we grow up, Unfortunately, our education system doesn't always take that into account. And as soon as we are able to, we start to dictate what it is that we should be doing and how we should see and how we should interpret. And so for me, I think we lose the most important part right there in the early years. That's the most important part. And I mean, motherhood, what is that? We think it's something that's not important. Okay, you be a mother. And we also allow the birthing process to be constructed and dictated to by a very patriarchal idea. So I think all of those thoughts and my own experiences um, certainly bring that to the fore. And, and now being a grandmother, it's the same thing, um, you know? to go into that space and understand how it is that a small human being wants to communicate itself in the space, wherever that space is. And how do we actually acknowledge that? You know, how do we allow for that? So, yeah, have I answered your question? I think I'm into upon a tangent then. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. And I think in the context of silence as a room, um, for, for context, uh, Carl produced a series of works which he describes as amulets which are to be installed uh, in a larger body of, uh, or a larger installation which was created just outside of Richmond which is a small town on the sort of main archery between Johannesburg and Cape Town. Um, and the works were produced by hand, uh, touching and basically squeezing, molding the earth into a series of different sort of shapes um, some which 
have a quite a clear sort of impress of the hand, others which don't. Um, and again, the, the idea of touch or touch as a, f as a kind of way of knowing the world, of maneuvering your, your way through the world, is also something that comes up um, in Inga's work and the residue and the use of materials. So in the space, Inga did a, an installation um, on, on the one wall uh, using ochres. Inga, are you uh, there? Check. Oh wait, he needs to be admitted. My bad. Uh. Okay. Hey, Inga. Hey. Hey, sorry, Hi. man. I didn't realize. Um, you're waiting to be admitted. So we we're just talking about Carl's uh, work and the way, way that like um, touch is is uh, really crucial uh, as a way of navigating yourself through the world. So as a kid, you learn to pick things up and put them in your mouths, and you process things in a way that's not necessarily through the written word or theory, uh, but through your senses. And I introduced the work of yours that you did at Nairox. Um and yeah, so that's where we are to to catch you up. Cool. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, d I mean, do you want to chat a little bit about the process of producing the work you made at Narox, the uh, sourcing of the various ochres and earths that we used, um, your relationship to those materials? Um, sure. Uh, yeah, well, I went on a residency last year. I was in the Hanspai. They took me to a quarry where there was naturally occurring ochre. Um, yeah, I thought the colors were interesting, reds and oranges. And I just wanted to bring that to the wall. At least I wanted to bring the material to the space more directly without a substrate necessarily. But just, yeah, the stuff. Mm. And the... The the application, I know that using your hands is an important um, component of your practice, right? So, uh, granted, yeah. some at times you're using brush and so on, but the the touch, the feel of um, the materials that you work with, um, yeah. I'm interested in why or how touch comes into your practice. Um. Oh, a couple of things. I mean, yeah, in some of the earlier work when I was working with soil and layering and using compost and debris and all kinds of things, it was, uh, I guess I had a realization that the brush leaves a mark and I wanted to use my hand, which leaves its own mark, but yeah, just that tactile sort of thing and wrestling with the material is kind of more so what I wanted. But I, I mean, at some point I really wanted it to, you know, to kind of draw some uh, meaning, I suppose, from uh, Tosa traditional practice of covering the walls in cow dung. That's how we plastered our our uh, living spaces, essentially. Um, it's called Usinda, but it, lives a, it leaves a very specific kind of sort of semicircular repetitive pattern on the wall because of the way that it is applied. Um, so I think that was interesting to me in the beginning. Um, but yeah, I think now it's kind of it's kind of shifted. It's I don't know, whatever works best is what I like to use. And I, I did use my hand a lot for that work. But um, when I was working drier, but when everything got wet, I kind of I'm kind of compelled to yeah use my hands when I can, but mostly use a brush. Um, but I think I also it's because I want a certain finish, right? And uh, I suppose ochre is not cow dung, so it's not going to give me that sort of density and that thickness. Mm. Um, but yeah, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think about those particular meanings, uh, with regards to Kosa culture, but I think I also, you know, uh, I'm realizing a similar thing about sort of, uh, learning differently and trying to value that a little bit more. Um, I actually wish you were here at the center. Now I was like kind of trying out some, uh, 
awkward stuff with like angles. I'm cutting this piece of fabric and I kind of had a moment with myself where I was just making a weird little rig with rope and chalk. And I realized that, I mean, there's probably a, a, a mathematical way to do this thing that I'm trying to achieve, but I don't <laughs> have that, you know, and I have to sort of be, uh, I have to just do it in a way that I can see. I don't know. I just had a thought about like learning in a completely different sort of direction or whatever. Um, where I know what I need to do and I have some sense that there probably is a mathematical way to get that and to do it with, you know, exactness, so to speak. But um, yeah, it was just interesting to sort of step back and watch myself do this thing with these kind of rudimentary tools, a rope and chalk and, you know, uh, yeah. I don't know if that answers the question, sorry. Uh, sure. I mean, it's also just like understanding that these, um, Materials, you know, I I remember reading this quote by Maurice Marleau-Ponty about honey and the way in which honey um, also clings to you, right? So if you if you dip your hand in a in a pot of honey and pull it out, it's not just that you're impacting or imposing on the space or the volume of the honey, but that it comes out with you, yeah. that it sticks to your hand, that it has a certain stickiness yeah. which we associate with that material, and so there's information yeah. encoded in the material. Um, that leaves an impression on you. Uh, it's something we spoke about in the first panel, and I think like uh, this is where Jesus can also talk a little bit about your work and the way in which, you know, the study of fossils. You know, you're kind of, I guess, looking for information that's embedded within it. Um, I don't know. I really am um, knowledge ground zero here. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. So I actually gave some images to uh, Sven. I don't know if he he passed them. You have the. You don't have the images, right? I do. Because I I understood that I'm an outlier here, and uh, I needed to maybe you know put this information in the screen so that you follow what I'm saying, a little bit. Uh, and essentially, you know, I followed the text that you just read, to try to to see if. You know, I could make sense of not only what I do, but essentially what the fossils actually evoke in our minds beyond uh, the typical fossils, you know? So there is a PowerPoint or there no? It wants me to update. Uh, because I can. Oh, okay. Fantastic. Okay. So, you know, I was trying to put everything under the same, um, under the umbrella of deep time. And, you know, and how the fossils, you know, because, well, well, essentially deep time, I think, is one of the largest achievements of the union between physics, paleontology, and geology in finding, in, in understanding the history of time, of life and Earth's formation and everything. So. I hear what you see in the screen is actually what we call indirect fossils, and it means that so, you see what they what sorry, it is, no, but you don't. See, or at least I can't see. You can't see. You can't see. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm just taking photos. You're, you're showing us a, a separate screen, I think. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. 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 There you go. Can you see now? Mm. Yeah. Okay. okay, fantastic. So we call these indirect fossils because you see the fossil, you, you see what it is, and it's a dinosaur trackway, but you don't know which dinosaur made it, right? And I found these fossils really, you know, really um, actually amazing because I w I'm, I'm trained as a biologist, I'm not a geologist. So the rocks for me were a mystery, and fossils the same. So when you see a fossil and you see an animal, it evokes you reality and you know it's a, you know, whatever. Even if it's an, an extinct animal, you recognize an animal. But when you see these trackways, you see that an animal passed by, but you don't know who made it or what it was. So I'm bringing this, so if you can pass to the next uh, image. As you said before, now we have tools, mathematical tools that allow us to even infer the speeds of the animals and everything, the sizes, and so on and so forth. But if you go to the next slide, you'll see that 
the one that you just saw before and this one actually evoke imagination in a way that not normal fossils wow. do. Because what you see is the foot of a dinosaur imprint Lose. imprinted on the rock in Australia a hundred and this is 88 million years ago, okay? Yeah. So you don't know who made it, but definitely it was huge, right? And uh, like, you know, the, the thing is that this evokes supernatural things. And imagine that this is something that now we can measure and understand. And as I said, we can yeah. infer sizes, speeds, whatever, right? But in the Paleolithic, these people were seeing these things in the rocks. And I, you know, thinking about this meeting, this colloquium here, I was thinking that even deeper in time, other humans, and I'm speaking about Neanderthals, for instance, were seeing these things imprinted on the rock as well. Mm. So you can imagine how our own understanding of nature joined superstition in a way that, you know, you see a chicken foot the size of a table, this table, like a meter long. And that makes no sense because if you and that's my point if you find if you find a, a fossilized dinosaur even if you haven't seen it humans have been wandering around the world everywhere so you find new animals everywhere so it's surprising and it's encouraging to understand nature but these types of fossils actually evoke something further because it's something that you understand is a chicken but it's a chicken the size of you know it's humongous it can and it's imprinting on the rock so there must be magic there. And that's why the science of, science of paleontology in this sense has gone even further. We, don't, we still don't really understand how this happens in the rocks. We have an idea, of course, but we don't understand the whole process that well because it's, geologically speaking, very complex, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, in other fossils, we're even seeing that they might be even a little bit biogenic, so bacteria and algae are helping the process of fossilization itself, but here there's also other things, right? And imagine this, you know, Paleolithic and way beyond thousands of years before trying to understand what this was and how it built upon and impinged upon their imagination in understanding the world from the superstition and the supernatural into the real world and combining the natural world with that. And that's why I thought, you know, uh, in this sense, these fossils are the ones that push the limits to understand them because the other fossils obviously t take you to evolution. And now we're all used to speaking about evolution and we know organic evolution in many ways. But these things, you know, kind of like burst imagination in other ways. So imagine really, and I'm talking my own, own experience, the first time I saw a dinosaur trackway, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't really understand what was going on there. And, as a biologist, geologists yeah. see it in a different way, of course, but you know, so that's what I'm trying to, you know. And so, obviously, they bring you down in deep in time in a completely different way from a different avenue of, you know, imagination that I thought it was interesting to, you know, show and, you know, kind of incorporate this in the notion of deep time. That, in mm -hmm. fact, as a paleobiologist, for me, the Paleolithic is, is today essentially. This is almost no past. So I work in 140 million or 120 million years down in time. My colleagues can go to the Cambrian 580 million years. My colleagues working on the origins of life go 1,000 million years, you know. That's deep time. That's what we call deep time, you know. So that's why I thought, you know, this would be an interesting settling for knowing about our history as compared to the history of life, so to speak, you know, and put us in context. You know. mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but I want to say something about this big foot. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about size and, and certainly putting that in our human imagination. We've always been fascinated by the size of things. And I think that's been um, decidedly a very patriarchal view on, on things being important and of great value. They have to be big. Um, in contrast, I've been very interested with, with the tiny little things. And I think my work in the land 
took me to spend many hours looking at tiny ants that create these amazing structures um, that can extend for 50 meters and even further, um, you know, with just a little neuron as a, as a kind of brain. But being able to create such a sophisticated architecture, for me, the small things um, are really profound. And I mm. think they need to be located in our imaginations a little more. I think not so long ago, the COVID virus was certainly in our imagination and it was very real. And it was minuscule. As a biologist, mm -hmm. you would know mm -hmm. that these unseen things from which we all uh, became, you know, part of this universe mm -hmm. are in fact quite profound. So I just, I, I couldn't help myself. I had to say that part. <laughs> but I mean, that, that dinosaur um, fossil is quite fascinating. We've always yeah. seen it, right? Yeah. I, mean, I think I always think about, like, we, you, know, you say the tiny, you know, I always think about the sort of incremental, um, especially in nature, right? Like, mm. you know, a single blade of grass isn't an entire field. Um, and our, right, our, like, our relationship to that, our, the effect of that potentially of seeing that visually is quite different, to the, the, maybe similar to what's being described, you know, you see such a giant sort of fossil thing it kind of yeah your conception of that thing is is shifted a bit and that scale does something to your maybe sense of self and awareness of yourself mm. um, yeah but definitely i think interesting considerations right the 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 minuscule and the monumental um but i always like to think about the incremental i guess was my point like i always like to think about the tiny things that build up you know the massive mm -hmm. thing, especially in nature. Um, yeah, I mean, I think about, yeah, I suppose rocks as well as this kind of sediment that builds up and finally solidifies over, I suppose, an inconceivable, almost inconceivable amount of time. I mean, when you talk about millions and billions and <laughs> like, I, I don't know, I think maybe I have it as an idea in my mind, but, you know, if we go back to this idea of sort of um knowledge through experience or through sort of you know kind of maybe tactility but i think just experience in in a very general sense of encountering things as a way of learning them um of measuring oneself up you know um yeah it just seems so inconceivable you know like when you talk in billions it seems yeah i don't know incalculable to me it seems impossible it's, yeah the one the one thing that strikes me on on seeing this as well is how and i think to some extent in each of your practices in each of your fields and your research um the role of absence um as presence so the imprint is a negative of a body that was there right um Carl, in silence as a room, um, your you know the, your treatment of silence is as a constituted, constitutive, sort of resonance or, or field or framework, um, and so I mean this is also something something that um, Seethler was writing about, and so it's like on my mind at the moment, um, but nothing as a generative space or, or working from from that. Uh, I mean, one of the things that you mentioned was tracking movement mathematically by the way that the imprint, I don't know, slides across the ground or like you can pick up on velocity or something. And so you have these series of frozen moments that track the movement of this dinosaur and you can kind of calculate mathematically what speed it was moving or you can, I guess I'm thinking about the incremental here and, and the kind of process of trying to, follow a thread from one point to the next and then how much you can kind of deduce along the way or how much you can intuit from the way that the body interacted in space with other things. Mm. Right? The sort of residue of the thing, what it leaves. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, do, do you want to talk about that film-based work of yours? 
Gutung residue. Um, right? um, maybe uh, in some ways. Um, well, yeah, I guess. I mean, I think it's interesting to think about that, right? Like to think about those absences, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But I also. I don't know, in thinking about residue for me, like, I mean, yeah, it can be that negative space, right? It can be that, that imprint that it leaves that kind of becomes the, you know, the clue. Um, but I suppose I was thinking about something that's maybe, you know, not really visible uh, as well, um, mm -hmm. but a kind of a different kind of residue on the physical body um, of any given person, really, and kind of what we carry with us in our bodily sort of manifestations, let's say. Um, and I think even those have, in a sense, their own kind of residue in their histories, of course. Um, I don't know, we scar, we grow in a certain way. And I think for me, it became interesting to consider the relationship between land and body and to think about how those things sort of shape one another simultaneously. So when I was speaking about residue, I think I was just speaking about that and like, I suppose a sense of self as being tied to a sense of belonging. Um, and I suppose, yeah, that has to do with sort of identity and place as well. So I think that these are the kinds of sort of invisible residues, the kind of imprints that are left on us by landscape and place um, and the kind of imprints that we leave. Um, yeah, and considering those kinds of residues, I guess, as kind of a, I don't know, just an open sort of way of thinking about, uh, yeah, one sort of existing in space and being in space and also kind of reading other people um, in relationship to their sense of place or their place, you know, where they're from, mm -hmm. cultures, these kinds of things are kind of um, part of what I kind of think is that residue in a very open way, but yeah, very different to sort of very measured ways of, of, of going at those residues, right? Of trying to figure something out with them. I mean, I think I have a similar sort of aim, um, but I think their sort of measurability is quite, I don't know, um, open-ended maybe. I think I used kind of both of those. <laughs> Sorry, it's there. No, go for it. Please. No, I was just uh, reflecting on, on Inga's comments now. And I think there's something to be said about the lived experience and being directly engaged in the material and in the time of the forming of that material. And I think that has been my experience. As much as it was, I brought in pi r squared and um, I had to try and, and satisfy people about the structure that it didn't fall on anyone's head, um, and, you know, the references to accuracy and all the rest of it. There's something intuitive about working in the land that, mm -hmm. that actually also dictates how we should be listening to what the land is. Now, remember, you know, like marking out this space, um, even the days when I had help, um, some people that, especially when I, I worked with some of the men, they kept wanting to cut into the earth in square and straight lines, while I wanted to create the rounded earth and to actually work with what the contours of the earth was doing. Mm -hmm. so all of that, you know, was quite intuitive on my, on my side. It was intuitive and it worked and it was about listening because the land holds so much information, not only historically, it has mm. information about who and what lives there, but how I respond yeah. to the land and how the land responds to me, which we, we completely lose when we are talking about big graders and we're talking about time and we're talking about we need to get this done now. Um, there's something completely different and maybe um, the way in which we engage the world will be so much different um, if we just slow down a little. And yes, we sometimes we talk about light years. As you're talking about deep time, there's also the idea that we're exploring our galaxies and we're exploring space in terms of light years ahead and beyond us. 
So what happens about us being in the immediate moment, right here and right now, how are we responding mm -hmm. to today and right here and right now, um, mm -hmm. in small and large ways. So, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, and I found your work very interesting. The applications, I wanted to put my hands there as well. <laughs> but I mean, I, I spend so much time working with Red Earth that I yeah. smear all over me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It happens. I mean, I, I enjoy those kind of ephemeral things as well, you know, in the process where it's like I can't I can't capture this, I can't freeze this, but it's kind of just in the in the swing of sort of practice as well, which can be quite yeah. interesting. Um, but I think you're also kind of making me think about, you know, the things that we can't measure, right? The things that maybe the land is may be able to communicate with us that aren't intelligible in the ways that we are listening or that we are the sort of frequencies that we might tune into. Um, so I guess I am interested in that. I like from a, you know, to hear the sort of scientific perspective and, you know, kind of measured senses of that time as well, of that deep time. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I've become quite interested as well, like in the work. And I think this is, you know, I think why maybe it comes out as art or it has to kind of come out in the ways and materialize in the ways that it has. Um, I think it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of not something I could write or, you know, describe or sort of say, but uh, it, or even something I could sort of capture in or on a single image plane. Um, I just think it's, yeah. The, yeah, I'm maybe very interested in those things that we cannot sort of, or that we might not be able to, or, mm. you know, the immeasurable things, the in, unintelligible things. Mm. The, I guess, I mean, I'm thinking here about the, the will or the desire to try and, I guess, make things proximate, to, to uh, make them relatable, bring them closer to home, uh, or to grapple with what, that sort of unfathomable thing is. I mean, and again, alienation is something that comes up for me. Um, be it the alienation that one feels towards the environment through processes of industrialization and globalization, and not you know, um, the kind of estrangement that happens between oneself and the world writ large outside of our sort of urban centers, or if you try to you know, get into a place, or you know this similarly processes of alienation that happen through historical um, socio-political uh, factors or through deep time and looking at things that are so far away that you have to kind of rethink or reposition yourself in some way um, I think you kind of touched yeah. on that uh, uh, briefly when your experience of seeing this giant footprint and how that kind of threw you um, but yeah, I, I, from what I understand, you also, your work also, you, there's the zoomed out view, but then there's also the sort of micro, nano sort of molecular uh, field of study. Um, more or less. So the thing is that we work in a fossil site that has a resolution that is almost like being there in a wetland. So um, it's almost like if you had a window of that to that ecosystem, and therefore we're asking, we have like a time machine. And we can see in the vertical, so in a shorter period of time, but really in deep time, how did things change and evolve? But we're still developing and developing the, you know, the syntax of that and how to approach that, because that's like really, really difficult to do uh, because it involves many variables including you know geology and understanding the whole thing but um, but in a way it's something that is quite unique because it's the very first time we have the opportunity to understand a whole ecosystem from deep time uh, and that brings us to microevolution instead of macroevolution so two different scales um, and also going to and trying to understand the resolution of the of the you know the preservation of the fossils how how fine 
tune can they get? How 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 do you say how the preservation how what the resolution can be? How far can we mm. get? So we see bacteria, for instance, now perfectly well preserved, and wow. we're asking whether we can go below that level, say virus, for instance. Mm. But this doesn't mean mole molecules, it means structures, because it's been substituted by stone, so to speak. It's not stone itself, but, you know, it's a reproduction of, uh, a physical reproduction of the molecules themselves, right? Not the molecules, but the combinations, like the, the, the structures, the proteins, and things like this. Um, but that, so far, is just the, the future. I mean, we're, we're starting to delve into that, but we, we haven't yet done that. Um, and in a different scale, we're, you know, and this is what has also been really surprising to me, is that in paleontology, inevitably, we see the world from, from where we are right now, modern times. And we see a dinosaur transforming into a bird, and we call it a bird. And so we treat it as a bird, and we study it as a bird. And then when we get deeper into its histology, the skeletal structure, and all the information that you have from really well-preserved fossils, you realize that that is not a bird. But it's not a dinosaur either. It's something evolving <laughs> in a transition. You know, as you were saying, like stage by stage, it's a process, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so we tend to categorize where, in fact, what we're dealing with is a continuum. And so we need to develop mm -hmm. the new language and, and, and that allows us to code for a continuum instead of parceling things in boxes because nature doesn't work that way. Right? No. <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. So we're in that point there of, you know, trying to to force biology into that because the physicists know how to do that. They use the math, they use, you know, they have calculus and that works. For us, because we're dealing with living entities, it looks like we have to deal with them in a different way, so we can't apply that type of language. And so, but we need something that, and also qualitative expressions that allow to, you know, it's, it, it, you don't lose empiricity by just qualifying instead of only quantifying, you know? But in science, that is tricky, it's hard. Uh, but we're there also trying to understand evolution from a different prism so that the language allows us to express something that otherwise will be stuck in the 19th century or the 20th century, you know, it's just kind of, so yeah. Is that, is that because of like singularity or the, the need to identify a specific being as its own being and not being able to say? Oh, it's just because we are, we have a taxonomy. And a taxonomy mm. means boxes and this is this and this is that. Mm. But you miss the transition and what you're li seeing is a transition. You don't see one or another. And so yeah. you'd need to typify so many things that at the end you would have a continuum, you know? So it's the syntax. The problem is the taxonomy itself, which is linear yes. and it's two centuries old in biology at least, you know? But it's just the way we... Uh... Carl, I'm oh, thinking... I'm so interested in this. I think sorry. the way... Go ahead. No, 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 sorry, Inga. I'm just thinking about dreams as revolution. Carl did this installation, yes. and um, do you want to talk about it a bit? No, no, you go ahead. Um, it's, uh, it was in Durban's, um, just off Westville campus, the university, um, so southeast coast, and it was an abandoned nursery, and, and Carl brought together, I guess, the organic and non-organic plastic and plant life and sort of brought these, you know, um, you know, it's two things that we kind of separate. We don't really think necessarily of plastic as having organic qualities, even though it's being compressed and composed of minerals, you know, that process of extraction. In my mind, that, that exhibition and that installation, it was, it was born of a particular time and you had to go there to experience it. You had to sort of physically be there and understand the, I don't know, I guess an experience not just of things you can see, but again here, smell, touch, feel, uh, trying to recreate the body in relation to, and it had a temporal life. So Carl talks about how the, you know, it became overgrown, how other people in the community uh, surrounding, you know, she, she didn't, couldn't control it in the same way you can an exhibition in a gallery environment or, you know, you don't have a real constant. So that process of, 
something evolving or not necessarily, it, it takes on a life of its own and it conflicts or uh, not conflicts, what's the word, uh, confounds taxonomy mm. in a very interesting way. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, I agree with, um, uh, so your name is Jesus. 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 Sorry. Yeah. Jesus. That sometimes, you know, we get stuck in our own little boxes. And I think as an artist, I actually try to, um, to denounce a lot of knowledges, including my own, whatever the, those are in order to find something else. And I think with that work, which also dealt with understandings of evolution, so I'm interested in what you're saying, um, even the work with the land, it's about just trying to uh, get rid of all of that to allow the real science to come through. Because if we put in these boxes about that's life sciences and that's biology and that's archaeology, Yes, we need those areas of expertise, but sometimes that falls in the way of us being able to understand our world a little better and interpret it a little better. So I do that quite often, and certainly from the perspective of the lay person, someone that doesn't know. And so planting things in plastic sculptures and they're growing and feeding the sculpture with compost and all of that and engaging the land in, in, in those ways, where the men who are helping me to plaster are telling me, you don't put that in there. And I'm saying that I want to put that in there. I want to put the sand in the plaster. And they say no. So afterwards, I, I go and do some research. And I discover that by adding the clayey red soil to the plaster mix it has strengthened it by 25%. So there is some science that somehow indirectly emerges, but I approached it intuitively as a mm. woman that wanted to take the land and put it back and take the land mm. and put it back. So, I mean, I, I like it and I, I find that extremely interesting. And I think yeah. as artists, we, are, we have some of that freedom to be able to kind of mess around with all these, these borders and barriers. Now and again, someone tells you to go back into your box, but you can ignore that and carry on. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's so much, like, kind of, I think this is what I get excited about to kind of, you know, try to articulate these things through art making is just the multiplicity of possible meaning, right? And how those multiple meanings can coexist in that single gesture or single object or relationship of objects etc um i mean yeah as as you know jesus is talking about this kind of the kind of strict taxonomies within the sciences i'm thinking about how sort of revered well at least for me you know when i was a student among peers and friends you know it was to be multidisciplinary as an artist and to be able to sort of go into these different disciplines and to bring them together in a i suppose a fresh way you know in mm. a challenging way um yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I can't, you know, I can't imagine working within one one sort of space and not being able to sort of breach those those borders a little bit and bring something back and, you know. The, um, to, to go back to that Maurice Marleau-Ponty reference about the honey, uh, one of the beautiful things you were saying about it is that you can't disassociate, like we have the word honey and what we're talking about there is the sticky thing that if you touch, it, it sticks to you, right? And we, we have particular words that we use for that um, experience. But when you think about it in different senses, like if you think about it in the realm of taste, its sugariness, the sweetness is also a very clingy, you know, it, it has a similar association, but we, did, we compartmentalize them, even though all of, you know, when we say honey, what we're referring to is the broader, or trying to refer to the broader sort of um, experience of honey. And, and honey as a, as, a, as a medicine, the medicinal qualities of honey, we leave that to the sciences and then eventually it becomes some pharmaceutical language. But there's all of that. Honey, also romantic. <laughs> okay. Sorry guys, I missed that a little bit. Um, <laughs> 
I went off. Oh, okay. Honey, you, you missed us talking about you, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. But I mean, it's such a, uh, sorry, I wasn't really in the conversation just now, but it's uh, like when Sven, when you were describing this, I, I just find that, find that so interesting as, as like an occurrence, right? That like you touch the stuff and it kind of sticks to you. Like, I don't know, it's very particular, I guess. Um, and that it kind of adheres to you um, and also becomes this kind of encasing, right? Um, mm. If something does fall inside of it, I, just kind of suspending. I don't know. I just find it very interesting as a material, and I, I guess I'm thinking completely differently now about that sort of, you know, touching it and it touching me back. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, I mean, the the part that you missed there was also about how they describe. Um, it's not just in the realm of touch, but um, taste as a very sugary substance, it kind of clings to the palate, it has a way of holding on in a different sense, and so all of the words that we use right. to describe it are associated, um, but there's also, it's a bodily knowledge, it's not, it's not mm. necessarily something, so we use words to try to yes. translate those various things, and I guess the process of translation is inherent in any, in any, um, Mm. And, and it's limited. Mm. And it's limited too. Can you can you share the screen for a sec? Can I share the screen for a sec? I, I just yep. want to while you're talking, I, I just want to find this image. Um okay, I think you would have to enable me to share the screen. Um. Uh yeah. Okay. All right. Am I sharing the screen? No, not yet. Not yet. Uh, share screen. Okay, there I am. All right. So I just want to do to to speak uh, two, a little bit. Two seconds. I've just got to pull this across somehow. Uh, oh. I can see. Oh, you can see. Yeah. Oh, but wait, it's on the. Oh. Uh, is there a way to get it onto the screen so that online can see as well? Yeah, you got to the screen here. Ah, sorry, I didn't want to complicate things. No, I it's I cool. Just... Okay, can you still see, Inga? Yeah. Okay, cool. Go for it, Carl. No, no, so you were talking about um, the body and, well, I think we have all been talking about that in some way. Um, about the body experiencing something, experiencing a taste and a sensation, and how that that experience, while we try to describe it, for instance, the honey, we can talk about it being sweet and so on, but perhaps we can't quite explain it until we actually um, immerse ourselves in honey, until we actually put it on our tongues, and and it becomes a part of us. Um, it just made me think of this image of my feet being completely immersed with the the red clay soil, you know, the red clay of, of that space, and how those eventually became the amulets, which were the, the kind of totems or the charms to incite a sacredness in a particular space. So, you know, there are ways that we are trying to explain it, but actually some of that you can't explain. I can't tell you how I actually made those amulets and why I made those particular ones and why they turned out to be 12. You know, it was just something that was happening at that moment, completely immersed. And being part of, of, of an artwork that I'm making of myself and of it. Mm. I just wanted to say that um, also the, the mark making while digging this hole, which on some level I wanted it to be one meter into the ground, like a womb that holds meaning and that holds a person and can sort of encase them and make them feel nurtured and warm. That those were the marks that I had to leave 
behind. And so can you see the, the layers of, of that space? Oh, that's, that's sediment. That's about so many years of building up of um, people that were there before, that had campsites in the area um, during the end of World Wars and so on. It's all embedded in that space. And if I had to dig deeper, there would, there would be other revelations and probably Jesus would be able to explain a bit more about what I would have possibly found in mm. that space had I dug a little deeper and longer. And from what I understand, there are quite a lot of fossils in the crew. This is the crew. Yeah, I think um, I think we I had um, as you know the depth that I had gone was quite still uh, superficial, and there had been a few um, metal objects that had rusted over time. Some of them were almost unrecognizable. Um, there were claims from some of the members of the town. On the one side, some people said that was from the Boer camps and the others people said it was from the English camps. But we also know that a little deeper, the Stan had traversed that land and had left their mark. Um, but all of that is felt in the land. I, you didn't have to say that this was this level and this was happening there and this was that. Uh, it was felt. Thanks, Finn. I, I just wanted to share that. I don't know if I if I should show what the fin the silence room looks like, or if you have time for that. Yeah, I think flip to it. It would be nice just for everyone to get a sense of what the final work um, materialized the into. Final work. Yeah. Um, so I'll just do very quickly. I'll fly through. Those are my implements. They're very sophisticated tools in terms of you know evolutionary process <laughs> right <laughs> that's a very long and this work um you know you'll see the straight lines where i had some men to come and help me one day they wanted to make straight lines and then i kept trying to turn those straight lines into the the kind of curve of the land rather than trying to fight the land to go into the straight direction, whatever. Um, okay, uh, those were some of the amulets that were made from the same clay, from the same space. Um, okay, sorry, let me go the other direction. Uh, so this is the, the inside, wait, where is it? So this is the inside of Silence's room when I had completed digging and now needed to build um, a dome shape because it needed to replicate um, the pregnant earth, the pregnancy of, of, a, of a woman, you know, a womb. And this would be where the amulets would be situated once I get them back. They would be embedded um, around the, the silence room to kind of incite um, a sense of sacredness, perhaps. And don't ask me about those amulets, why those shapes and what have you, I don't know, but I know <laughs> that uh, there was just a compulsion for me to make these and to do them in that particular way, in that particular shape. Um, so I think one day it will be clearer to me, but for now it isn't. That's the inside, the interior spaces, um, the curve, the entry, which again, um, there's been, there was a, a few people that have been visiting the site and there was a rather large man that said, why didn't you make the, the entrance a little bit bigger? So I said, you should be asking your mum that um, this is of course a, this is, of course, a womb, you know, and the idea of also being a little bit humble in entering a space like that, being able to bend and to walk into it. Um, a large man or a smaller person 
we quite comfortably experience the space. So, you know, we started to deal with all of these issues, the humility of entering in something. You don't always have to be big and take over and, um, you know, dominate a space. You can perhaps encounter it in silence. And mm -hmm. that's, that's mm -hmm. the reason for calling it silence as well. It's a little yeah. limp on the horizon. It's like an ant hill made by an ant. Uh, a female ant, but, but it was an ant anyway. Okay. Wow. That's it. Well, that's a beautiful full circle. I think um, we're running out of out of time. I don't know if you have any last uh, sort of remarks. Uh, if either you or Ingo uh, want to say something um, before we close off. Um, but if not... I've got lots to say, but I think, um, yeah, uh, maybe another time. But I think that was a really interesting work and... Um, yeah, making me think about some of the stuff that I was, I uh, went to the Karoo for about two weeks last year and uh, also kind of got really swallowed up in that vast landscape and compelled, <laughs> you know, to create something of a, you know, um, hardly articulable sort of reason um, or form or function, etc. But yeah, um, thank you. That was cool. Thank you, Thank too. You. Thanks, Jesus, for joining us. Thank you, Thank uh, you Carl. Thanks yeah. for inviting me, Sven, and it's lovely to meet you all. Very lovely to meet you, Carl. And, and you, uh, Jesus. Yes, yes. Yeah, too. I wish Thanks we had more time. So many conversations. Eh? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> for sure. I'll send the email intros. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> okay. Please. Thank you, everyone, for, for coming out, too. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank you. And I must say I'm jealous about the Karoo. I would love to go. You know, I've never been, and uh, I hope I Amazing. sometime go. You really should, yeah. 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 I yeah. know, but you know, <laughs> I have to have time, and you know, have, I'm working <laughs> on the material for I the Karoo. I need some help. Yes, yes, yeah. I need some help to go and complete it. What? So maybe that will be. Yeah. She needs help completing the, the silence room. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, then you know, you know, you have my email. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. It's hard labor. <laughs> um, it looked like an excavation, though. So you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Simple. Yeah. A regular day for you. Yeah. 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 Good. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Bye. All the best. Bye. 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 Thank you very much.